The F and Rad Snowboard Podcast is presented by Vans. Oh yeah, I wanted to be absolutely not attractive to snowboarders. Maybe we need an injection of that, because it'd be interesting. And I didn't sign the contract, I probably just had it in my bag for a couple months. <laughs> and we're all like, oh, that's just banging that it run. We pushed each other to become better. Front three tailed it. Season 5 of the F and Rad Snowboard Podcast is sponsored by Wired Snowboards, The Boardroom Snowboard Shop, Anon Optics, Crow's Nest Barber Shops, Tribute Board Shop in Nelson, B.C., Mount Seymour, Grouse, and Cypress. I worked at the boardroom from 1993 until 2006 and watched the shop grow from a hole in the wall into one of the world's premier snowboard shops. The owner, Murray Fraser, has always been committed to providing the best selection of the best snowboarding products with the best customer service anywhere. The boardroom offers a performance guarantee on everything they sell, so you're going to love the thing that you buy guaranteed. Visit any boardroom location or check out boardroomshop.com for all your snowboarding needs. Derek Height's a rare breed of human. When I met him at his workspace in North Vancouver, I walked into another world of remote-controlled craziness. He and his partner Jason Toth, who's another ex-pro snowboarder, run a company that facilitates action shots for Hollywood and stuff, and the toys they have include a BMW X5 chase car with a Russian arm, drones, giant remote control cars, electric bikes, and yes, even one-wheel skateboards. But Derek wasn't always a high-tech film facilitator. He was once a pro on Burton. He was a half-pipe ruler and all-around amazing snowboarder. Please enjoy this talk with Derek Height. I just, I don't even know where to start. What was I just talking about? What were we talking about? <laughs> drone Tran- rules. Drone rules in Transport <laughs> Canada and how I bought a drone before I realized how much trouble I'd really made for myself. <laughs> yeah, no, the early days were funny because we, uh, like I said, we were, you know, doing what we could to get stuff. And uh, once they called, it was like, okay, now this has got to get a little more, a little more legit. And it's Transport Canada. I remember back in the day, Cypress built a half pipe on Skychair. And then they had it underneath the chair. I think there's a shot of somebody dropping from the chair oh, into yeah. the half pipe. And it was a Transport Canada issue. I remember being like, why would they give a shit? That was like, um, I think it was Eric Peyota and those guys. And Mark Gelp got a shot of the guy sitting on the skids of a helicopter up in Alaska. Yep. And they had to like... Uh, I've seen the shot. Yeah, they had to hide the numbers on the on the, on the the bird and everything because... They, really? Oh, yeah, they, they got some... They, oh, I think they got some inquiries on that one. Right, because okay, that's that's exactly it. Where snowboarding meets like this stuff, people in snowboarding are you know like Jeff Keatley rode the the cable line, the cable line, yeah, yeah, right, yeah, and that's not allowed. Yeah, I mean, not just not allowed. Like I just realized now that the reason Transport Canada was tripping about that chairlift being over the pipe is that ice and shit is always falling from that cable. Yeah, sure. And if somebody gets hurt, Transport Canada is going to be like, well, what did you think was going to happen? It's ice f- falls from it all the fucking time. It's funny when you grow up and you go, oh, hold on a sec. There was rules for a reason. Not, now you care, but back in the day, you're like, ah, who cares, man? Just I do it. still, and sometimes I don't care. Yeah. You know what I mean? No, we still do it, I guess, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, no, that's true. I mean, even sliding the cable, too. I mean, those uh, all those those things back in the day. I mean, every, anything, I mean, it's like, look at the happened to the cable in Squamish with the, you know, those guys that cut it. I mean. That seems impossible to me. Like, it seems like. That someone would be you, that crazy. You, you would have to be. You would have to be ignorant. Like yeah. you wouldn't do it knowing how much trouble, like how much danger you're putting yourself in. Yeah, yeah. No, it's the the the, the mindset of what that guy or person went through is on another level for sure. So what we're talking about is there's a there's a gondola, and I don't know your feelings on it, but mine personally, I was like, I don't know, a sightseeing gondola in the middle of. Like, it's kind of ugly. The thing that was so nice about that area was that to hike up the Chief is, like, it's a beautiful day hike. Yeah, yeah. But then to give access to rich, fat people. Right beside. Right beside (laughs) it. It kind of took away. That's how I felt, right? And I don't... Okay, so now somebody went and cut the cable of this gondola. Yeah. And I don't think it was someone who was like, hey, I don't want rich people up here. 
Yeah. I think it was more like uh, I it was it, it, the room. I mean, everyone thinks it, it, it's definitely the old school people, you know, the people that were the real the original people in Squamish that obviously mm. you're not so happy about, you know, the, the are big... we talking about like the, the native people or are we no, talking like about old loggers, miners, you know, guys like the originals in Squamish that just, you yeah. know, I, I'm just speculating, but it's just, you know, it makes sense. You got all these young kids that are coming in that made the town, you know, in our eyes, a hell of a lot better. I mean, it's it's a, a hop in town now. It's like, you know, yeah. there's, there's cool stuff to do. There's, you know, gondolas you can go access the mountains and, and go touring from and mountain biking. They made a conscious decision in about 95, because I remember hearing about it. The town, like whoever was elected officials in mm-hmm. mayor and city council, changed the the towns like to the outdoor capital of the world that was like they said like let's go we're going from an extraction resources like rich place with mining and forestry and all that kind of stuff Mm -hmm. and we're going like let's embrace these young people and i think that's been like a tremendous success right Mm -hmm. like when you go to squamish we were talking about this too squampton okay it's not like Compton in any way <laughs> it's a bunch of rich white guys yeah. with lots of toys oh yeah and a, and a, it, it's it is like an outdoor capital yeah it's gorgeous I and mean, it was always the drop off from from Whistler you know, if you couldn't if you couldn't find a place in Whistler you'd go to Squamish but right. but Squamish is now its own destination and we've got so many friends and uh you know people who work with it that made the the the, the chosen effort to you know, we're leaving Vancouver now and moving there. I mean, it happens all the time. There's uh, businesses that we deal with in Vancouver that we're like, we're selling our car company in Richmond and we're moving up there and bringing all of our equipment up there. It's just, you know, it's a better quality of life. It, it To me, it's like, you know, it wasn't my cup of tea back in the day, but I see now, you know, with raising kids and stuff and, and the outdoor side, it's, you know, I always loved Whistler, but Squamish is a, is a great place too. Yeah, if you live in Vancouver and you were like, okay, I'm all grown up now, I'm going to buy a house. Okay, where can we start looking? You're like looking in Abbotsford. <laughs> and you're like, well, it's, no, fuck that. Yeah. Abbotsford's way out the oh, valley yeah. and the commute's ridiculous. Yeah. I way rather drive that sea to sky oh, every yeah. day. It's well, beautiful. Live by the ocean live versus by the ocean. live by a farm and yeah, not totally. see anything. Yeah, yeah, and there's mountain climbing. Like, there's a huge mountain climbing uh, community there. There's a huge ski and snowboard community there. Mountain biking is massive, yeah. obviously. You see mountain bikes everywhere. Yeah, yeah. And then the bird watchers with the eagles and everything. Yeah. Un- it's an unbelievably beautiful place. Well, and all the, all the cool things that are opening up. Willie opening up all the air houses and all the... You know, there's, there's it just, it has all, it, it's starting to have more things than Vancouver does, you know, yeah. at least funner things. Yeah, 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 yeah. They're, they're talking about a, a stationary wave there too, right? Yeah. I just heard that. Yeah, there, a friend of ours is involved in the, well, was involved in the, the pitch of it all. We, it was pretty interesting. It's real. Chat. Like, the, it's really, like, being talked about at least. It's being talked about, yeah. but the funny thing is, like, the, the one the one place that they pitched and, the, you know, was all over the news was the place in Britannia as being the, spit, the, the spot. yeah. But, you know, um, you know, I, I guess I can't really talk to it, but it's it, it, it was all drawn up, but it actually was never even like I don't it was never even brought to council. They, it they, wasn't there's proposed. No, it was there's just no like, permits or anything. Hey, hey, there's a place here that it could fit. Exactly. Yeah, that's it. And yeah. it looks awesome. And maybe Hell, that yeah. maybe that was the best way to do it. You know, build a groundswell and get everyone stoked. And then yeah. the, the, the city goes, OK, well, yeah, this maybe this will make sense. But mm-hmm. Um, it's going to take away one of the best filming spots if they do that. Oh, <laughs> you film there. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're there all the time, yeah. It what would, do you do about the kite borders in the background? Oh, they can paint them out. Yeah, they, do they in paint post. them out. That's unbelievable. <laughs> yeah, 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 I remember seeing that that spit up there. It's always windy, Yeah, right? And yeah, I, yeah. somebody's explained it to me. There's some sort of thermal weather in there that it's very consistently windy in there yeah there's uh one of our cable cam guys that works for us matt mataloni um he uh he's there i mean he kite boards and, and kite uh, you know he's known foils now as well but oh foiling uh, too yeah it's uh but i mean yeah so when it's you know super wavy and windy that's the best place to go out uh, with a foil now you, know, you can you don't get bounced around but yeah you know, the wind every afternoon it's like it's just it's just right on time it's uh there used to be and maybe it's still there like a ferry right yeah, that, that goes go, over to uh, the yeah to the mill over there or whatever. It's a mill, yeah. It was like you could see like grungy workers getting on this ferry. Yeah. You're like, where are they going? Looks like well, they're that, going to prison or that's something. That's LNG now, isn't it? Isn't that what it's going to be? I have no idea. Yeah, I think that that whole thing is going to get turned into the LNG plant that they were. Uh, What's LNG? 
Uh, liquid natural gas, those, uh, you know, the big LNG uh, talks right now, that's, uh, I don't know if it's if it moved forward or not, but the last, you know, the, the, we've had quite a few town town hall meetings about, you know, people against it or people for it. And right. So, kinda... yeah, now you've got this, like, logger community that's been there forever, mm-hmm. this outdoor community that's moved in, and a lot of people feel like they've been there forever. Brian Sunday is a friend of mine that I knew through Jamie Sherritt here in Deep Cove. Who he bought a house there in? It had to be around two th- between two thousand and two thousand five, mm-hmm. and I remember being like, because he told me how much he paid, and I'm like, oh, that's so sketchy, dude. And it was like a tear down, you mm-hmm. know what I mean? But then by two thousand six, two thousand seven, it had doubled in price, yeah. and then probably doubled again. And by now, it's probably doubled again. Yeah, yeah, right. Like he's got a house in downtown Squamish. Oh, it's right downtown. It's like yeah, right wow. there. Yeah, beautiful view of the mountains. So that'll be a six-story apartment building pretty soon. Right, exactly. Yeah, and he was talking about there was a spot where they where he, he built a backcountry hut, actually. Hmm. I have no idea where. And I, even if I did, I wouldn't say because <laughs> <laughs> he. it's like him and maybe, you know how it is. Like two or three buddies will go like, okay, we're going to take this secret spot. Yeah, yeah. Nobody knows. That's the like when I was a kid growing up in Ontario, like we had our secret spots, but like the mountains weren't mountains; they were like a little bump. Mm-hmm. So, you know, you out can't here, hide a little secret shack. In no, a bump. you can't <laughs> exactly. Like, man, what's that plume of smoke coming up right there, like a, a kilometer from the highway off a dirt road or uh, whatever? Just someone smoking weed in Kyber's hut. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like. I, that's what I always think of when I think of backcountry huts is Kybers. Yeah. But I, but the Brandywine one that b- burned down that was commissioned or properly built. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's a whole other like Sierra Club style backcountry hut. Those those that Kyber hut. What a what a spot, hey. Yeah, I remember ma- Jamie Lynn had signed the wall, and, oh, yeah. and you read the wall, and you'd be like, "Oh my God, look at all the people who've been here." Well, that was those are the glory days when you you could go to Kyber's or you could go over to uh, you know where Harmony is now, where there was no chairlift, and they had the big camel humps, and mm-hmm. those were you know those were all the, the the hike two spots that were all you know like the secret stashes. And I mean, God, where, there, where did you where did you come to Whistler from? I grew up in Calgary. Yeah, yeah. So like uh, snowboard shop era. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was uh, I worked below. Uh, I, blo- I worked below the snowboard shop in uh, on uh, 17th Ave, like uh, you know. So Ken Ock was upstairs every day, and I was uh, I was working at a place called Iguana Snowboarding Accessories, making wax and. I remember leashes. Iguana. Yeah, so I yeah. used to I used to crimp all the little spiky, cables. Spiky spiky pads. Exactly the stomp and, pads. Yeah, uh, the bone. The, yeah, the, the bone. Spiky bone. You know, I have one. I have an iguana. <laughs> Yeah, and maybe maybe I made that one. Oh, that's amazing! Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that was it. It was uh, I. I grew up there, and uh, uh, you know, worked every day after school. Worked down there, and then crimping like, leashes. You said, yeah, yeah, yeah like pouring wax. Big, uh, you know, we were in like a, like a thousand square foot little thing below the snowboard shop, just breathing in wax fumes all day long. Right, and, right. But uh, but it's no, the gold school. rush, right? Like that's what it is. Is that Ken was like the first guy in Canada to have a snowboard shop, maybe the first guy in the world. Yeah, and. So, like, yeah, who would have done the accessories? Who was Iguana? Um, a guy named Graham Strobel owned the company. Mm-hmm. And uh, and Graham, you know, Graham's still part of the, the whole snowboarding association in Alberta now. Uh, you know, he's got, like, his kids, uh, you know, competing in contests. And so, you right. know, the next generation. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, that was the crazy thing. You know, like, I grew up in Calgary. And I remember, I mean, I grew up skateboarding, you know, in the 80s and uh, I remember when my friend uh, Robin Tangenall was, uh, he went to school with him and he basically, he came to school one day and showed me a magazine of snowboarding and probably 88. And yep. I was like, okay, I'm trying this for sure. I was so fed up with skateboarding. I mean, I would like, you know, we would launch garbage cans in the back alley <laughs> off a launch ramp. And yeah. I'd, if I could even get a little indie air, or like a little, you know, method early, grab in there, I would be grab. stoked. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I just, you know, not being able to grab your board, uh, you know, it was just one of those things. I just, you know, you could never get enough air. And uh, that was it. Like when the first time I ever went snowboarding with Robin, uh, hitting and jumping, being able to grab my board, I was like, oh my God, I just grabbed my board. And, you know, I got in the air. It's like everything you couldn't do when you were skateboarding. And yeah, and, like and the danger was like you would crash in snow. Yeah. As opposed to like falling down the <laughs> stairs and hitting the handrail and smashing your teeth out. <laughs> yeah, even just off a launch ramp, like yeah. the road rash and the, you're just hurt all the time. Yeah, yeah. 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 yeah, yeah that was that. that's amazing. And then, you know, that being, uh, you know, opening the magazines, you know, international magazines at that time and having all the people that lived 
you know, in Calgary in them, I was like, well, hold on a sec. Why, why yeah. isn't the, the whole pinnacle of, I mean, not the whole pinnacle, but a massive part of the snowboarding industry, you know, ISM magazine and snowboard and all these magazines, everything was from Calgary or from, you know, the Achenbox or yep. Don Schwartz or Evan Fien or, yep. you know, all these guys that were around us and, you know, in our snowboarding association. And I was like instantly drawn to it. I was just like, wow, this is really, is it originating from here or? It never, it didn't, but it sure felt like it did from, from a big I think part. it did in a way, you know what I mean? Like when I, because I've gone back and I've looked into it, I didn't know this before the show, but as I'm going into it, there was kind of hubs. Calgary moved to Whistler eventually. Oh yeah. Right? <laughs> Everyone did. But Calgary was a hub yeah. and then it joined with Whistler or yeah. it took over Whistler. Mm-hmm. Tahoe was doing its own thing completely for a long time too. Mm-hmm. And it bled into the same like there was a connection between Ken and Tahoe yeah. for sure. Yeah. And then Europe was doing its own completely independent Ra- thing. race boots and sure. Sure. Peter Bauer and John Irvin. But there was some pretty cool shit going on over there too. Like Nitro was just you know yeah, like you're right. but remember they called it Nitro USA at some point. But really it was still there was a real European flavor to it. Yeah. So that was like a connector there too. Yeah, yeah. But it, that Calgary thing I think it's it, the the ripple effect of of what happened there is still happening. Yeah. Also, one of the things about Calgary that's crazy, and you were a skateboarder, did you see the early iterations of West Beach, like those shorts and everything, or was that just off the radar for skateboarding? Because um, he started in Calgary, didn't he? Uh, Chip, Chip, yeah, yeah, I and then know. he moved to Vancouver. I don't know. I didn't. I didn't know that. But. He he probably moved to Vancouver in like because I remember the first West Beach house <sighs> was already <laughs> gone by the time I got here in '93. Yeah, and was like run down and everything. They had they had a store. Yeah, they had a storefront across the street from it. So yeah, you didn't see like Chip Schilling. I remember more homemade like, shorts. No, I remember like Yukon and Mackie was big. Oh yeah. Uh, um, what else? Like Bar, I, but no, not West. Bar I mean Fight, West Beach. Yeah. You, would, I mean, you saw West Beach clothing, and I mean obviously everyone was left to go to the West Beach Classic contest and stuff. And yeah, uh, but I don't think that was. Uh, Did I you can, win a West Beach Classic? Uh, I, I never. No, I I went to quite a few of them. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, you didn't win. Uh, you didn't get a first. That was your era. I can't remember. <laughs> I remember, I remember, it, I did not too bad, but uh, yeah, there was some crazy. I mean, the West Beaches were crazy. I remember the first year they, they did nuts. the, the very first um, border cross they did, and uh, Hawken rode the thing switch, Unreal. and killed everyone. I mean, it was just like crazy to see the talent of Terry on that. But uh, he's insane. Oh yeah, yeah. another yeah. level. And even him, him in half pipe at that time, that was his. Oh when yeah, he was just dominating. Oh yeah, when he used to come to Camp of Champions, I mean, that was it. Everyone would just stop on the side of the half pipe and just watch and be like, <laughs> "How did that guy just go three times higher than everyone else?" You know, it just you couldn't, you just couldn't put it together. Like he was eating gummy bears that no one else had or something. Yeah, it was yeah. just crazy. It's but, true. Was it apparent to you? Like, could as a as a snowboarder, could you see like, oh, he just rides more than anyone? Or he just has better edge control, or he just edge control was a huge one. I mean, definitely like in the in the sloppy you know pipe that you get in the summertime up uh, you know up a camp, you know he could still edge across the flats and flat base it and just like fly up the walls and be like you know three times faster than anyone, and you'd just be like how like how did he just do that you know yeah I don't know it's it, it definitely was a um, you know it definitely was a talent that he had that no one else really. I mean, nowadays I feel like everyone everyone's got that. They learned whatever he had early, uh, like all the all the kids now. I mean, people go way faster. Um, oh, absolutely! But it's but it's he, it's evolved to something that just is. It almost isn't the same. No, yeah. sport anymore. Hell no! I was just talking with Spencer O'Brien, and she says that in in the Olympics there's a feeling of like, hey, do you even really snowboard? Like you train most of the time into an airbag. Yeah. And then you only really are on snow for contests because you don't want to get hurt, but you need to be at that level. Yeah. And well, that's can funny. you imagine that? Like I, I remember going up Black Home in the summer mm-hmm. and seeing those. The water jumps. The water jumps and yeah, being yeah. like, that's cheating yeah, yeah. or something or being like, that's just ridiculous. Yeah. How, how is it economically possible to build that obviously looks expensive like, what's the benefit to that? Yeah, yeah. Like, you're crashing into 
water. Yeah. Yeah, no, that, that was, would, I mean, that you're was. You're landing flat. You're like, it, it doesn't seem to me like that would give anyone an advantage. But then obviously to do, you know, triple flipping, triple twisting yeah. aerials, that's what they did. And now we're at that, but they have airbags that you can land on yeah, right yeah. away. Yeah, I, I, that's why I think that was the, di- I mean, there's a lot of differences between my, my, my sort of time and snowboarding and what is going on now that's for sure Mm -hmm. but uh the you know i we we all trained ourselves and and there was i mean you know yeah we had coaches at the last minute you know with the canadian national team the olympic team and stuff like that but it was never like uh uh it was a last minute rush to get it done it was never (laughs) a real thing we all had to train ourselves we all had our own you know regimes and how we did our you know whatever and, and learned but uh, it, it was it's nothing like what is going on now where it's like, you know, you know, we go do a snowboard contest, go to the open or go to Nippon open or whatever. And then we go off and shoot a thing in the backcountry. You know, it, it was just, and then you would go and do a border. Cross. You did everything. Yeah. You, you yeah. rode everything. You did everything and everything was fun. But I think, you know, at least I know I in my in my personal opinion, I get I get bored if I was to do one thing and train and train and train at it. I need. Right. I need difference. I need like uh, I need multiple things going on. Well, plus on. snowboarding attracted us because it was fun. Exactly. Right. And that doesn't look fun. Yeah. I mean, maybe it is like and, and obviously for the people that take it to the Olympics, that is fun for yeah, them yeah. or else you wouldn't do it. Yeah. Hopefully. Um, but yeah, it was so much fun and, and everything was so open. Like you say, you'd go to a contest and then you link up with the locals, and then you'd get to ride some weird backcountry place. Yeah, yeah. That you know, or hit a jump, or there'd be a filmer there, or a or a still photographer. Yeah, that's pretty sick. So in Calgary, um, like, did you wind up getting sponsored and that kind of thing there, or did you move to Whistler with like aspirations? Yeah, no. We when I was still in school, I got um, it would be it was like I think eighty eight. And uh, 88, 89, and I, you know, it'd been a you know, couple of years uh, snowboarding by 90 or 91. And, yep. uh, you know, I'd done like the, the ASA contest, the local contest and stuff, and, you know, won a few and, you know, placed okay and others. And, right. And then uh, I think it was in 91, I uh, went to Quebec and I won the Nationals for Half Pipe. Oh, perfect. And so, you know, like all the boys were there. You know, there's still people that are around now, you know, Yan Wa and, you know, Kale Stevens and then, Sick. Uh, Steve Harris was there and he looked like Jeff Brushy at the time. It was pretty funny. And That's awesome. Um, and anyways, yeah, there was, a, you know, it was a whole thing. And so, I, you know, I, I was, when I was in Calgary, I was doing contests and doing pretty good and uh, picked up Burton when I was still there. Um, and was then, that after that Nationals win? I was riding for Burton before that. And then after the Nationals, I think I went from riding for Gilmore Sports, who was the distributor at I that remember. time. I remember, yeah. Rod Gilmore, those guys. And Rod then, uh, Gilmore, and amazing. They, and then I got a call from Burton, Burton, and they were like, you know, we got, you know, then I got onto the. Yeah, you're the national champ. Like, yeah, and then, you got to be on the, you're, you're moving up. And that was, and that was, a, you know, when that went down, I had, you know, I was, um, I was sort of the younger person in a group of like all my friends, Paul Nelson and, and Tim Nelson and Hugh Fraser and all these guys that I aspired to and, and, and Al Clark and, you know, all these guys that were, that were older than me, they all moved to Whistler and I still, you know, I was, uh, about two years younger. And so I went, when I finished high school and I think it was 92, uh, literally the, the, the day I, I graduated, um, I had already packed my bags and my wow. parents put me on the Greyhound bus and I, on I went to, went to Whistler with five duffel bags and moved into staff housing. And that was it. I, uh, I, you know, I went there for summer camp. And then after that, I found a house there and met some really cool people from Saskatchewan and, and all around that are good friends of mine now that, that were just moving there for fun. And, um, and that was it. It was, you know, I just, I just got, just pushed and pushed and pushed and, um, did a couple of photo shoots when we were in Whistler or when I lived in, in Calgary still, uh, a good friend of mine, Jamie Kalon, who uh, runs a, a company in, 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 Alberta still, uh, he worked at the snowboard shop upstairs and, uh, he phoned me one day, actually he came down the stairs, I think it was to Guana and he said, Hey, there's a photo shoot going on with Transworld at Island Lake Lodge this week. And, you know, why don't you go, uh, got, I've, I've talking to mark gallup photographer and i was like i know who mark is like are you kidding me sure i want to go for sure and he i don't like lodge like uh yes please and so um uh went there and uh it was there with i think it was lynn mccormack from from herschel he he was the other kid too and i think it was lynn and so we were just there and we did a little photo shoot with mark and you know i came back and uh a couple of photos got run in transworld or something and i was like 
you know, I, I just remember I was, you know, when you're a kid, you yeah. open up these catalogs, Burton catalogs and magazines, and you're like, oh my God, like these guys are so lucky. Totally. And I remember the the, the, the photo ran in, in Trowns World. I had a couple shots in whatever little local magazines at the time. Concrete but, powder or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, but that was a big one, and that, after that, I was hooked, and I was just, you know, I was trying to push and push, and so that was it. I was like, I moved to, you know, I moved to Whistler with the intent of trying to uh, keep and having more fun and uh, and see where things went. And you had a taste for it. That's cool. Yeah, yeah. And Whistler in '92, because I moved here in '93, uh, fall of '93. So by summer of '94, you know, I I had a summer pass, and you know, the feeling up there. It was pre, just pre, they were like going to pass a law or a bylaw that you couldn't swear up there. Do you remember that happened? Oh, every time I say it, people look like, no, I don't remember that. The, like yeah. they were reacting to the snowboard influx yeah, and they were yeah. like, okay, this is a civilized <laughs> European <laughs> ski town, you yeah. guys. We can't just have people living in closets under stairs <laughs> and going to Max Fish every night or whatever, going out and like tearing God, those are fun times. places apart. Yeah, yeah. Re- oh, yeah, the tear gas riots. Unbelievable. And the, we'll put any names into that one, but yeah, yeah. there were some yeah. fun, There was crazy stuff that happened. And I remember the summer camps too. There was, uh, uh, yeah, there was those parties where the – Whatever that rugby team from Oz came up, and there was the <laughs> riot that went down with all the snowboarders, and yeah, I know it's uh, you know what though, but Whistler made uh, its name in in snowboard history on that side too, and I mean, absolutely, it, it was one of the first places that you know uh, embraced it in a way too. But yeah, it does ring a bell. They did have some weird. Uh, I mean, the police were very active in things, too, because there was all kinds of, you know, you had the Creekside mob and you had all kinds of funny things like I that. I love right? the Creekside mob because oh, yeah. I was one of the dummies that, like, <laughs> kind of believed it. You know what I mean? Like, it, it snowballed into something where people were, were talking about it as though there was a mob yeah. and th- that they were doing bad things. Yeah, yeah. I can remember seeing Nick's and being like, oh, fuck, that guy beats <laughs> people up or whatever. You know what I mean? Like, like propaganda yeah. works. Yeah, yeah. Creekside Mob's got to be one of the first, like, crew. Canada's had so many crews, right? Like, and, and snowboarding in general has had so many crews. Yeah. I don't know. I would put the it four, out there. The 418, and then you got the, the Creekside Mob, and you got yep. Grenade. and Yeah. Yeah, no, it is funny. They, uh, I don't well, think Creekside Creek, Mob quite had the... Uh, the uh, the clout, but uh, yeah, they were more of uh, they're more of fun and partying than they were about uh, anything. Well, well, I don't think that they they tried to make it a crew. I no. think it was a funny thing, yeah. right? There was a joke. I think is what yeah. it was. Yeah, yeah, but it became a thing because yeah. the snowboard shop guys they were just called the snowboard shop guys. They yeah. weren't called like the Calgary mob or something. <laughs> they were just like you. Oh, you're one of the snowboard shop guys. You're yeah. from Calgary and you're here now. Yeah, okay, yeah. Where, whereas that Creekside mob thing it. It became something, like I said, that it, that I think that might be the starting point for all crews, but I'm not sure. Yeah. Yeah, because, no, it's true. It's... Because Terry Kidwell and that first generation of Sims guys, they didn't have like a they were no gang mob. name. <laughs> <laughs> it's so funny because not, like to be a snowboarder, really, nine t- times out of ten, you had to have grown up with a family that could afford to buy you a snowboard. Yeah. You know what I mean? If you were one of these guys that was hustling to to like get a snow, then you couldn't get lift tickets, or you didn't have a car to go to the thing. Like oh, we yeah. all had, you know, we all had money. I'm not saying we were rich, but we all were in that class of like money and free time. Yeah, where you could go to the mountain. And then act like an asshole. That's really what we're doing. Like, can we can we do that again? That was a lot of fun. <laughs> that was so nuts, yeah. man. I remember when they allowed us on our home mountain in Sudbury, Ontario, Adnac Ski Hill, sixty vertical feet, one T bar, two runs. Yeah. The first thing we did was start sliding the snowmaking stuff. Oh yeah. And yeah. then the ski patrol was like, "That's high pressure pipes. If they." explode yeah yeah we, you die why are you doing and transport that? canada's coming back here. Transport Canada, exactly <laughs> and i and remember stop being, all in those slow signs it's, oh definitely don't all the slow sign you're kicked off yeah yeah indefinite i don't know if anyone got banned for life you get kicked off for the night and it was kind of a badge of honor by the end of the night if you hadn't been kicked yeah. off you weren't snowboarding did you have a license i made one i made my own <laughs> fake i made a fake 
license. Did they have that in Ontario? You had they had it. it. Yeah, they yeah. had it. They looked at mine and they said, "That's nah, we don't recognize that." Because I just like took a picture, and I laminated it with tape, and I like <laughs> a clear, clear packing, clear tape. packing tape, and oh, I like awesome. typed up like my name, years riding. I you probably put like ten or something. But it had been one, and uh, I showed it at Mattawa. And they were like, oh, we don't accept that one. You have to do the test. Thing. That's funny. And then I I couldn't even ride. You still point. have it? Oh, I bet it's somewhere in my place. Do you have one? I, there's still one in a box somewhere. Yeah. Oh, my yeah, God. Rigid. Where did you Where'd you get it? Yeah. Alberta. Yeah. Yeah, there was a Alberta. You know, you had to do the funny little prove that you could, you know. Heel slip, side. Yeah, toe turn side. and stop and stop. put a leash on. And it was, whatever. Oh, put a leash yeah. on. I can't even imagine. Yeah, it was it was hilarious. I can't remember all the things, but uh, it's got to be in a box somewhere with all the seasons. There's got to be someone, too, that has the, that did up the protocol for what it would take to be licensed. Yeah. Right? Because th- that started happening pretty early. Like, because everybody came from a ski racing background. A lot of people did, right? Mm-hmm. Like Ken did. So, like, yeah, you look at snowboard and you go, okay, well, here's the way we need to do it. You need to have a protocol. You need to have a, a way to teach Once it. again, rules that came from another sport being pushed into something that it doesn't belong as well. Like, yeah. there's some weird, um, not to get off topic, but no. same thing when this all started, too. It was the same thing. It's like they, uh, when drones came around, they, they tried to lump us in with, you know, with aircraft. And mm. there is no, you know, direct relation with a lot of those questions and rules that they had asked. And you're like, you don't fly an aircraft from the ground and look up at exactly. it. It's more like kites. How do you guys? So kites. <laughs> what what's your kite laws? Exactly. You can't fly a kite over a government building. Yeah. Like that's really what it feels like when because I did, <laughs> I got a kite for my birthday that you fly with the two yeah two handles handles. You yeah. know, like I think they're called stunt kites. Yeah. And I went down to there's a place by Granville Island Vanier Park where guys do that and it is it's hard and I hit a goose one time (laughs) like a Canada goose hit one of my lines I was like what is that yeah what's the chances of that happening anyways I pretty good it's yeah (laughs) it was really difficult to do and really dangerous because when the kite comes crashing down you need to have however long your strings are all the way around you oh yeah where you're not going to hit anybody yeah and in vanier park there's people everywhere yeah, yeah. so you're constantly <laughs> almost hitting people with but the kite weighs about a pound yeah yeah and so as soon as you start flying drones and you're crashing drones into things you realize oh this little like there's a little bit of mass behind that yeah and if it hits somebody it's made of like sharp stuff that yeah. would probably hurt them really bad but it's Stick definitely not an aircraft yeah no no and that was it it was uh, they uh they kind of just took a whole bunch of stuff and tried to adapt it to this and it was uh it was a lot of it was off uh wasn't really hitting all the quite taking off all the boxes it was you know a complete different scenario and a lot of those things but yeah i think you said it off mic they they contacted you because of your sizzle reel like you made a sizzle reel of yeah, I mean, we, uh, you know, that was, that, that was gotten 12, 2012 or 2013. And we, you know, we had to start somewhere. So we just started filming, uh, you know, uh, car spots and whatever we could do just to go, you know, to show the ability of what we could do. Uh, but, you know, it, it wasn't a shoot. It wasn't, uh, there's was no production there. There was no anything there. So it was literally, you know, um, we weren't really doing it to make money. We were doing it to show, and that that still is, um, you know, business use. But um, it's hard to, you know, it's hard to come up with all those those things and pay for all that stuff if you're going to do it the, you know, the real way, uh, or at least, you know, at that time, we just didn't realize. There that. was no real way, exactly. right? Yeah. Like, I heard a story about somebody in New York City, right? Like, they went up and they flew the grid of the city. So they have a shot of every street. Sure. Right? What a smart thing to do. But then they got fined, and I think their fine was a million dollars or well, something. It was, like, a really, really crazy fine. Yeah, those were the guys that um, they... They yeah they'd filmed a whole bunch of stuff there, but they were also flying in LaGuardia oncoming, so they were actually in airspace. And oh, once shit. I think once the FAA, so that was the interesting thing. When we, like we started, uh, my business partner came from the U.S. because it was illegal in the states, and it had been illegal up until five four or five years ago still. So he was just like, I got to get out of here. This isn't you know things aren't going to progress. And he right. stayed he stayed in contact with the FAA, 
but uh, started the company up here, and we, you know, in Transport Canada was one of the first, uh, you know, uh, well, Canada was one of the first countries to allow drones and have it regulated by a government body, and they did a great job of it. Um, and a lot of the other countries learned from Transport Canada. You oh, know, cool. FAA pulled a lot from what, what Canada learned. Um, which has got to be the first time that they may have ever learned something from Canada, it seems like. But, um, but uh, it, they, they did a great job of it. But that was the thing is, um, is the, the states were running like uh, wild, wild, you know, wild uh, west times down there. People were still doing it, and they were doing it on film, film sets, even though it was completely illegal. These guys were filming in New York. You know, we only heard their, you know, we read the, the news article, but uh, oh, well, they, they kept on filming and shooting, and then that was it. Uh, once the FAA finally put down their rules and got everything set up, they started going after all these people that had been doing things for right. years. And right. so I think there's a, quite a few people that, you know, got uh, got kind of reprimanded, but that was a big one. That was a huge, yeah, huge fine. Uh, and it makes a lot of sense, though, They because that's kind of the way corporations seem to work, I don't know, where they kind of look at the fines and they go, okay, well, we would rather have Do it all now this getting, fucking footage, yeah, yeah. right? Because think about that. You can sell that indefinitely yeah and they can use it for every commercial or every project like you want but the drone shot over fifth avenue yeah like yeah. here you go yeah, it's never this gonna happen it. again it's never ever gonna happen again <laughs> yeah. or you could pay to get it done now yeah and and like you're saying jump through all the hoops and do it the right way yeah yeah and it's gonna be a million dollars yeah w- one way it's nine hundred and ninety nine thousand yeah. <laughs> and ninety nine dollars and the other way, it's a million. And, and your you know, name's in the news. Yeah, and your name's in the news. And, and no press is bad yeah. press. So, you know, we got a lot of jobs from that fine or whatever. Yeah. yeah. You know, and that's the, that's the thing. Even like even the, the stock side, if you try and you try and sell that stuff later, you know, the, they, uh, even the stock places, they, they all have to double check everything, where you got it from, where, where the right. permits. So it's really the trickle down, trickle down effect of it is actually pretty, um, is getting pretty, I mean, it's good getting really it's getting very looked over and no one's just allowing things to get sold or put up and and used you know they're they're going through and making sure that there's waiver signed those people that are in there were people that said yes and if it wasn't they'll just say we're not we can't use it yeah yeah it's it's very parallel to the snowboarding thing hey like because when we came you do your test you get your ticket and now as a kid you're like i can just go anywhere on the hill right yeah of course and we can wall ride that that uh, shack there, and we can be breaking things. Water slide and, the snow making. You got like beers in your jacket, and you're setting up a <laughs> campfire, and you're like, they're like, what the fuck are you doing? This is a run yeah. on a ski hill. You can't have a campfire here with beers. <laughs> like it's spelled out clearly in the rule, or it's not. Now yeah. they do. You know what I mean? Like now, yeah, yeah. I don't know. I I found. Um, yeah, early early industries, right? It's that's the thing. Uh, you you're there for, you see it start to materialize and grow, and uh, there's all these little funny little things that never get, you know, all these little loopholes and things that can always happen. And uh, right, it, when you're there in the early '90s, um, are you hitting like the black on wind lip and like getting a little bit to the side country? You're talking about like going out flute and stuff like that yeah yeah yeah. like is that almost immediate or is that does it take a couple of years are you we um well i can remember because i bought uh there was i think there was four of us in the valley that had sleds oh wow Uh, we bought i bought the 1994 1995 mountain max when they first came out serious and so it was uh i think maury had a, a sled yeah i think sheen had a sled yep um god actually i can't remember but there was about four or five people that had sleds and that was it. We started ripping around. What's the first day sledding? Where do you go? Oh, well, that's it. I mean, there there was, you know, sure there was people that had sledded, but not people that were skiing or snowboarding and right, sledding. Right. Uh, there wasn't a lot of that going on. And um, and especially now that you didn't have to jet them anymore, you know, everything had uh, elevation compensation built in. Oh, you cool. could You could just go up and rip and, you know, you'd have to stop and usually rejet your carbs and stuff, right? That was the... I have no idea about this shit, but yeah, I... That was the yeah. early sleds. They, yeah. They didn't have the elevation compensation built right, in. Right, and they didn't have the big paddles and stuff, too. They just had the little... Yeah, like, so like go up the side of the ski resort, not up the side of a mountain. Yeah. Right, right. They were made for groomed or hard pack or, yeah. like, riding on a lake that's got, like, blower... <laughs> You know, good for Ontario on it. Yeah, great for Ontario, but <laughs> where it's flat. Yeah, not great for yeah, mountain yeah. riding. So you guys had the first generation of sleds. That's yeah. We, were, I mean, we were. I, I remember going. 
we would go to Brandywine. You'd go to, I mean. Was that the first place you went? Because Brandywine's access is, it's yeah. still far to get to somewhere where you could actually ride Alpine stuff, right? Oh, yeah. Like, that's that's a long drive. Well, we had, you know, we we got guided by, um, a lot of the stuff we'd done was with Adventure Scope and stuff. So we, they were, uh, they had the foresight of getting, like, guides. And so, you know, we had some safety guides that always came on our shoots and stuff. Wow. And so they, we were going out and, and, you know, we had guides or people that had sledded before and knew where to go. Um, but it was like the first time that a film crew had gone to like, let's go build the kicker, you know, the cheese wedge uh, over there. And uh, now it's like one of those standard jumps you see in every film part. It's, it's one of those things where, um, you know, and then every year it was, you know, it grew by six times, you know, everyone started getting sleds and it just got bigger and bigger, but uh, there was no fighting to get to the cliff band and, uh, <laughs> Oh God, I don't remember the name of that place, but um, or that first the the first yeah. pillow lines a bit at the Brandywine Meadows there. Yeah, oh yeah, like you see those, and like when when you drive up there and you get to that, you're like, I have seen that from like every angle. Yeah, people doing the the double line and or airing over the last one, or yeah, you're like holy shit, this is a famous spot. Yeah, and then you just look a- along the ridge line, and you're like, oh, that's that cliff. Oh my God. Yeah, what a rad spot. I remember there was like a year though that uh, it was kind of near the end, but there was, um, and that this is now probably how it happens all the time. But we got there and there was, you know, I think it was Johnson or whoever got up at like five in the morning. He was already standing on the cliff band. And he was claiming, you know, it was just it was it was so funny how how things were going. Uh, uh, I want to hear about that because that's the thing is that you would go and there was just no oh, possible there. way somebody would be there yeah yeah and then all of a sudden well this was later on this is yeah. by 90 i mean this would be 97 98 when right. not everyone had sleds but exactly. in the early time yeah. i mean you you were going places you're like should we be doing this i mean can we go here i mean you're they, there was there was no tracks there was you know um we didn't go with people that were um you know avid sledders that were maybe you know like we got coached around a little bit by some of this the the you know sled um sled groups and stuff i remember that but you know after that it was just go on your own and you're out in the wilderness oh yeah. yeah yeah and like i can imagine with bc weather sometimes weather blows in and your track's gone and you're like oh yeah Holy White out shit <laughs> what do you do in that situation was there some panics where you're like oh fuck we gotta stay here overnight well, I'm here right now, so it definitely worked out worked out the right way. But uh, yeah, no, there was. I think there was some. You know, I, I can't remember at all. I tell you the truth, it was so long ago. And, like it's, uh, but there was there was some. Yeah, there was definitely some funny funny stuff that went down. Things breaking down, and you know, sleds going into lakes and stuff. Oh, like, everything God, yeah. everything you didn't know about that you got into, and you know, crash course into sledding. And then um, I remember one of the first shoots we did. Um, uh, it was a Burton catalog shoot in '95. And most of the team came in for it. Um, you know, Jeff Anderson was there, and Trevor was there, and uh, uh, I think uh, Jimmy O'Conn, and um, God, there's a whole whole massive group of Burton. Yeah. yeah. But um, I think the team manager Barry Barry Dugan was there, um, and Vince. Um, but we, so here you got all of these guys, a lot of them from the East Coast, uh, you know, from from Vermont. You've got, you know, guys from, from California, you know, Colorado, Jeff, you know, all guys. over the place. And they get up to Revelstoke, and this is where the shoot was. And it was, um, you know, Trevor just came straight from Nova Scotia, you know. Wow. You know, and we were, we were like, it was one of the deepest, earliest, you know, times in Revelstoke. Uh, it, it, I think it was in November, and it was like past your neck. It was so <laughs> deep. The shoot wasn't about getting shots on your snowboard it was about digging sleds out i mean it was like a week of just digging sleds out everywhere you go and that was yeah. it we, everyone was learning to sled that was the whole funny thing about it it was like you know in the end you you we were i think we were just kind of like doing funny things in the trees because we couldn't even get to the alpine i mean most guys you would get up to a certain point stop look back okay they're not coming go back down go get them <laughs> bring them up it was like and this was every day for like a week, and uh, but yeah, it, it was. I mean, and those 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 were early mountain sleds too. There were tanks. Like, I think oh, yeah. my, mine was dubbed the Red Anchor. It was like the, <laughs> it was the you know the thing was like seven hundred pounds dry. You know, it was like it was brutal. But uh, you've always been this techie guy because you're at the. This is got to be the cutting edge of the world for tech camera equipment that's in this in your business here yeah i mean we uh yeah for sure so it grew from 
like w- what was the first camera that you picked up like it was it would have been a still camera obviously yeah what when body I, did you have it was a um the model i can't remember it was a canon film camera obviously and mm-hmm. um uh you know various canon lenses was it eos like was yeah it, it was an eos yeah, system yeah. for sure so um, it was, yeah it, but yeah film yeah. um and uh what was your film you, you shoot ectochrome or do you remember oh, no, I, I was i was about as plain as i got it was yeah. you know put yeah. a roll of 640 800 in or something that was <laughs> yeah that yeah. was about as tech as i got i mean this was like uh you know uh back in 90 probably 92 93 i bought it oh and, wow and i was always just you know we were, you were cruising around on the Burton shoots or, you know, we were going to Sweden in, in the springtime and going on sleds and ripping around. And, you know, I was always just interested in shooting stuff. So, you know, I was shooting photos along the way. And uh, and then, you know, I, I, you know, one of the first times I got injured pretty bad, uh, we were in, in Rick's Granson and it was the year that, uh, you know, Ingemar had done that massive backside air. And so I rolled my ankle. I was there with uh, uh, VentureScope. So Brad McGregor was with us and uh, Curtis Croy, I think, and... Uh, we were with a little, you know, Whistler contingent, and uh, we were, you know, we were there. And I rolled my ankle. We were shooting at like two in the morning, sledding out in the backcountry, and I just did something dumb, and you know, so that was it. My ankle's, you know, pretty rolled, and uh, and that day was the contest. And so I just, you know, I had my camera there and shot, uh, you know, when Ingemar did that backside air, uh, shot that, and you know, I, I just remember that that epic feel of like when you capture something, you know, and then, you know, it was raw and gritty, you know, I wasn't like a seasoned photographer at that time at all. Right. And, um, so, you know, I remember we, we came back to Whistler and, uh, we brought it over to the, um, the photo lab over by the Chateau and, uh, Matt Demansky, um, was working there. I'm nice. pretty sure it was Matt, was Matt, Matt was in there and uh, the, fo- the, the, f- the stuff got developed and they phoned me and they said, Oh my God, where is this photo from? So they'd already gone through my photos and they were like, yeah. holy crap. Like, who did that? Right. And so when I got there, they'd already blown up a photo of mine and put it on the window of the photo lab. I'm, I'm like, hey, 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 it. come on. That's awesome. Yeah, you're like, dude, don't. They already <laughs> made copies and stuff, but. Uh, People are taking them home. Like, yeah, 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 this is epic. Yeah, they're selling them at the front door. <laughs> yeah, 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 no, yeah. but it was, it was, um, uh, we were, I mean, that was it. It was the fun of the whole thing back in the day with right, film Right, because there's no Photoshop at this time. There's not even no, digital no. photos. Yeah. And, and people would have saw that air which was oh but that the time air was, heard around the world yeah. it was so insanely big yeah and right. that was the cool thing about it i think i'd said this not so long ago too is like you know you were um you there is no instant social media to post these things it's like you would find out the next year when all the magazines came out or what right. happened six seven months ago totally and that was the fun thing about those times too is that you didn't you didn't know what other people the were lag up to. was great yeah, yeah. it yeah. was just it kept things fresh and it kept people wondering what's going on and who's got the cool new style and what's going you know what are they doing in europe and and totally. and that you know that photo was one of those things i remember that it, it, it was this little thing went around the industry and i remember um the mag a few magazines had phoned me because they knew i got a copy i had it as well right and um and then trevor graves who owned stick magazine uh, he phoned and he was i loved his he was an amazing artist and photographer and uh he was like hey i want it. i want it i just you know give me the raw gritty shot you know it was super backlit uh you know he you know, ingomar was just a um was just like a shadow yeah uh, and uh and so anyways uh you know a super gritty cover which is you know kind of the style of what stick what magazine was at that time too that's so. incredible but um yeah but, and shooting a cover shot must have given you you know you're like holy shit i could do this well that was more about being at the right place at the right time than sure. it was about uh right, <laughs> my, right. my photo skills no but sure. i mean it would have ignited something in you that oh, same sure. thing right yeah. like of getting that that trans world shot in the beginning of your career you're like, oh shit! Now I can do this. Yeah. And well, that now, was here where you. Are. And that was it too. Oh it was my like, god! All the filmers we were with all the time. You know, I loved, I loved looking at cameras. You know, and people mm. loading 16 mm-hmm. mil film and mm-hmm. that whole vibe, that whole like side was. Uh, I, I I was interested in it, and so, uh, you know, when when snowboarding ended for me, um, you know, I got I got out of Whistler in like 2000, 2001, and um, one of my best friends uh, who who was in Whistler, who was more one of my, you know, friends. He was there not really to be a, you know, try and get a professional career in snowboarding. He was there as a, you know, guy moved from Ontario, was just, you know, there for fun time. And then when he got out of it, out of snowboarding, he moved to the city and he got into the film industry. And so by the time I had left Whistler, he was already a a second AC on set. So he was a, you know, working on major film sets. He just worked on X-Men 2 
um, here in, in Vancouver. And, um, yeah, and Vancouver was Hollywood North at oh, that yeah. point, right? Like it was going off. On fire. A lot of stuff was, they weren't even trying to hide that it was Vancouver. Yeah. Vancouver's been the, the city in a bunch of movies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where yeah. the city's not me- mentioned. Yeah. Because, and it's because the Canadian dollar was so cheap compared to the American dollar. And the and it, you know what it is built studios. It, yeah, no, I don't. It's that too, but it's like you you look that way. You've got you know your mountains in Europe or Tahoe. You, right. you look that way. You've got a desert and you know out in Kelowna or Kamloops that looks That's like true. it could be New Mexico. And then you look this way and you've got urban city that is looking more and more futuristic. So it's got the ocean like kind of a Hong Kong you kind can, of vibe. You yeah. can play so many different things here. Oh, yeah, and then you've got you know that time they, they even at that time they had. Uh, so, you know, they had studios, they had tons of uh, equipment providers and a lot of trained, really, really well trained, uh, you know, camera crews, which was the biggest thing. That's always the, the weak link in the film industry is, uh, is the crews, if you've got good crews or not. Really? So, oh, yeah. It's um, that's well, I would say that's one of the most important things next to, you know, how much, you know, what, what the dollar value is in that country, um, uh, because it's it's you're wasting a ton of money if you've got people that don't know what they're doing. Oh, obviously. Right, so, right, right. Yeah. But Vancouver's got an amazing, uh, amazing reputation for, for all that now. I mean, the locations, it's got the, the people, the infrastructure, it's got a dollar that's working for it. And, uh, yeah, it's, you know. It sucked in a lot of those people that were in the snowboard industry because it was such a high paying, uh, you know, so, and it, and it takes that little bit of a rogue kind of mindset to be like, okay, I'm not working a nine to five. I'm yeah. just not gonna. Yeah. I'm going to do. You, you like know. variable. You like, yeah. you, you don't know yeah. what's going to happen. The phone rings or it doesn't ring. And right. Uh, yeah, no, I mean, there's a couple of things that I've learned from, from what it was that action sports did to the film industry, you know, on the film side of it, a big one is, you know, you've got, you got a, a camera guy that goes out. He's the DLP, he's the first AC, he pulls his own focus, he's the second AC, he does all the, the settings of the camera, he's the loader. I mean, he, there's one guy right now that did four or five roles, and that's the great thing about, you know, a lot of the, you know, over the years now of me being in the, in the full film side, I've run into so many, you know, old action you know, action sports people, you know, uh, Dave Sioni, who came up here on commercials, Whitey, sick, who's a director sick. from Kingpin Productions. Yeah. You know, we worked on a Jello commercial with Whitey. And he's, the, what, what, what I've learned is that, you know, every one of these guys uh, learned in the, in the action sports world how to work your ass off and how, yeah. to, cover, oh, yeah, how to do right. it, how to do it all. You, There's a shot of Sioni where he's got that helmet cam on. Remember the helmet yeah, yeah. cam that was yeah. like, I don't know if it's <laughs> duct taped around his chin or what, but yeah. it's huge. Yeah. And you could see, like, there is no way you could ride with that. Yeah, I think it was a 16 mil Bolex. They it taped. was a Bolex. Yeah, yeah. It was yeah. huge. But Isn't that's that it. The, the, yeah. That mentality of get it done. That's yeah. just what it is. And, you know, the film industry is is uh, is a whole different beast. It There's five, five, you're, you've just covered four or five people's jobs with that one person from the action sports world right now. That's right. like, you know what I mean? So that, that aggressive um, sort of like, I'm going to get this done sort of attitude that you get from the action sports world where people are like these adrenaline junkies that just go out and get things and, and make it happen. Right. You don't get that. I mean, you get that in the film industry, but it, it, it's, it's divided uh, now between five or six different jobs. Right, and because it gets, I've, it's an, uh, you're just blowing my mind here. It's an old industry. So they know you like, can't retrain an old yeah, industry yeah, and they're, they're, yeah. they're used to like sitting back a little bit and, and, mm-hmm. and being watered down and, you know, mm-hmm. okay, we might use you a little bit. Yeah. Whereas an action sports guy comes out and he's ready to go and huff it for 16 hours a day yep. and get it done. And, and it's that push and that sort of gonna like. Going to get the shot. You're like flying the drone. You're literally feeling like, I'm going to get this shot. Ah, <laughs> shit, I missed it. Okay, reset. Everybody reset. It's one guy, one talent. Okay. Yeah. All right. Climb back up. We'll move over a little. I'm going to ch- change the angle. So we don't get the track from the last one. And that's it. It's like you're, you know, now you're the director, you're the DP. So what you've mm-hmm. learned in all these years of making action sports movies is how to do everyone's job. And you go into a film set now and you're like, you know, you've, you've, you've had that, you have all those years to uh, direct people and to do what you wanted or what you thought would be a great way to sh- shoot this. And you don't get that in the film industry. You come down here and you work in the film industry, you get put into a, a line Yes. And you follow the rules and you follow what people tell you to do. Totally. It's not that you've got your own mind and you can go and do your own thing. Unless you're starting your own project, that's a whole different thing. But if you're coming on to a film set, you're, being, you're doing what you're being told. 
And that's where, in, in most cases at least, and that's where it's like you lose that artistic thing and you lose that push that the action sports world gave so many people that opportunity. That's and unbelievable. I did a Japanese cigarette ad photo shoot in Whistler mm-hmm. with Jeff Keatley where we're just two assholes. <laughs> That's awesome. I love it. I didn't smoke either. I yeah. had like a little kid at my house and I was like, <laughs> I probably was a little bit torn. I hope I was. I, I and but I was like, but it's money and it's a week yeah. in Whistler and I got a massage every night in the Jeez. chalet. They rented a chalet and it was at that slow pace. And there was a director of photography and there was a, the guy who shot. The, it was still ads and the guy who shot it was a National Geographic senior photographer. Sure. And um, there was a director, right? And and I remember. We didn't give a fuck about any of that. Mm-hmm. Like, Jeff and I were like, let's see that shot. Like, we were like, no, that one fucking sucks. Like, we, <laughs> see, we got to do it again. Because, and they'd be like, why? And we'd be like, because my hand is not anywhere near the yeah. board. It's like, a guy in the sky shot or a it, tindy. And it's, or, and it's, yeah, and it's a tindy yeah. or like, or this hand is like this. Yeah. And they didn't understand no. that at all. Yeah. And so... They liked us by the end because they picked our photos. That's funny. I've always told that story like they couldn't see it. Yeah. But what we weren't seeing was that there's a hierarchy that we're not. Exactly. We shouldn't even be talking uh, to that guy. That's And that was another thing I was just going to say, too, is that you um, you walk in blind. Mm-hmm. So you come from uh, Action Sports. You come into the film industry. You don't know that hierarchy or that, like, you can't just go over and. Talk bump to into the, the DO, DOP Come and tell on. him how to do his job. You don't. You don't right. do that. Right. Well, there's the people that did do that and do do that, and and they end up going further because they're not worried about this stuff. You know, when I got in, it was um, I was still part of the really old school uh, side of the film industry where it was like we're still loading film, and and you know, uh, a lot of the DPs were old, old, you know, older guys, and I mean, big guys. These guys shot you know big projects back in the day. You know that. Um, there was this level of respect that you had to give people and you don't just walk over and tell someone what to do or go touch their, you know, camera gear or (laughs) like you had to know this stuff. And I mean, I've saw a lot of people get reprimanded or booted off jobs, uh, for, for speaking up or for doing things or, you know, just walking over like, Oh, that, that sucked. Let's do it again. You know, like comment like that from a camera assistant, you'd be done in two seconds. Unreal. But that in a way that sort of, um, that sort of like, uh, what is the word I'm looking for? Like, you know, uh, honesty, uh, or innocence is almost, um, is almost refreshing because it became this ass kissing thing in the industry. I mean, mm-hmm. people just, you know, like, yes, sir. Yes, sir. And you know, that, that has its place and, and there should be a respect level given in, in certain things, but, um, you lose creative, uh, creativity and you lose maybe what could be the better shot. Yes. Yeah. If people don't, you know, speak up and say, Hey, you know what, maybe that, you know, that other shots way better than like right. what you and Keely did. And that's exactly what we did. And there was like, uh, they were following this weird script. I t- talked about it too, but like they, they were following this script where they literally had a binder of other people's ads and shots that yeah. they wanted us to recreate yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like we want you to be here An and image border. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. This image. Right. But the thing that they, that they used was us, throwing dice because at the time remember when everybody had dice sure and you jump brushy and the, ga- the gambling oh, yeah. thing and yeah and people were out in the back country having a beer when they're taking their lunch and, and oh, rolling and playing dice gotcha yeah, yeah yeah and like spitfire put out dice for skateboarding because skateboarders were getting into it too yeah, yeah like there was a definite slice in there where people were playing this dice game yeah and it just happened to be when they shot that commercial and so while they're setting up the shot to make some fucking, you know, counterfeit <laughs> bullshit, the real thing that was going on, the guy had the wherewithal to take a, f- a couple of photos of it. And, and at the they... end of the day, the DOP called us over and said, look at the slides. And then we were picking out the ones that awesome. look cool. And that's that's what ran the ads, which is that's so much more fun. But like, yeah, like I'm saying. We we were just innocent. Yeah. We weren't doing it like, hey, let's go tell these assholes. That sounds more like a Sean Kearns. <laughs> Kearns is like, no. Yeah, <laughs> we'll, yeah. We'll tell these fucking assholes who's boss. <laughs> Did you shoot with the whiskey guys at all? You were more, you were Burton. Like, Burton was... 
Yeah, I, I was, I mean... Was uh, outside of that whole, like... I, yeah, I was never part of the whiskey thing. I mean, I knew Kearns and knew Johnson. And, yeah. I mean, you know, uh, uh, all those... I mean, Mark Hassingay and Nix and uh, Todd Bowman. I mean, those oh, yeah, they weren't Bowman. all in, in whiskey, but um, sort of that whole... That crew, All, all those guys yeah. are, like, all guys that I grew up admiring and looking at. And, you, sure. know, I, you know, I was a kid uh, going to contests in Alberta, and they were there, and... So, um, but yeah, no whiskey. I, 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 um, I wasn't in it, but I sure had a hell of a good time watching them all. It, man, that was, <laughs> I, I, um, those guys started, I mean, jackass. That's all I can be said about that. hundred percent. They, they, yep. were, they, they, they did stuff that I don't think anyone else would, would want to do or redo. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, God, totally. they, were, they were epic. Yeah. I saw an actual documentary on it that never got, um, put out i heard about that yeah i watched it it was who, fucking crazy yeah who shot that i don't know it was like a film student who is now like she's like a respected documentary maker it was crazy it was made with mtv like mtv like produced it oh that's nice yeah the train uh, <laughs> train in the back um and it was so good and like it you know i, I was the innocent who? guy at the end of that saying to kerns like because they have Johnny Knoxville in the beginning and talking them up, saying like, yeah, these guys were the originators. And at the end, Johnny Knoxville breaks a bottle on his head. Yeah. And I said to Kearns, they shouldn't have ended it with the shot where he broke it. They should have ended it with a shot where it didn't work. <laughs> yeah, bounced where he off his oh, head. Oh, fuck. <sighs> where, like, where he really balanced it. Because that's oh, the man. money of whiskey. Oh, whiskey yeah. won, anyways. But yeah, I, I don't... It got kiboshed. The whiskey documentary got kiboshed because of music rights. Because oh, gotcha. M- MTV knew that, and I'm uh, uh, that they if if whiskey gets blown up, right? Because there'd be a resurgence of like you could sell a whole bunch more whiskey DVDs. Mm-hmm. But they didn't. They did not have the the music rights. Gotcha. So it's all, all went away. Yeah. So they it were looking so at expensive. the contract, and, and oh, MTV wasn't gonna. They're like, you have to sign for the movie rights yeah, uh, to the music. And then Kearns' lawyer was like, mm, <laughs> you're really exposed here. Yeah, yeah. Because now this isn't just snowboarders in shops. This is everyone in the world. I'd like to see that, though. Oh, I think it's gone. I checked the link, and it no longer exists. Yeah. yeah. Crazy. Yeah. Oh, those, were the, those were the best times, I tell you. Yeah, of course, of course. So in your career, what was your board? Like when you get your first package from Burton USA, are we talking about a stack of like 10 boards or did you have to pick one freestyle board, one race board for the season? <laughs> yeah, when, when, when it was with Gilmore, it was like that. Yeah, it yeah. was like, oh yeah, you know, you got one one pipe board and one like, you know, race board. Yeah, for sure. It was what funny. was your pipe board? What would you have picked at that era? Um like would you go the it was the pro model or would you go like the air no, series i did both um yeah. i uh i mean later on i wrote everyone's boards um you know i uh i always loved the airs for sure mm-hmm. uh the twin tips and stuff and mm-hmm. uh oh yeah and those are my those are that was what when it was like yeah oh, god i can't remember when it was gilmore what i would what i was ride but uh i loved hawkins boards and half pipe uh brushy's board obviously that was like my that was my favorite um yeah. And then you know, uh, always rode um, Johan's board out in the backcountry. Nice. Um, but I had everything. I mean, I was I was lucky. Burton. Um, I was one of the few that were, uh, you know, I I didn't have a, a, a budget for travel. I, it was an unlimited travel budget, <laughs> and it was uh, there was about seven or eight of us that had that. That just you 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 didn't you didn't abuse, but you always went where you had to go. And uh, it was the same with the product. I mean, I would. I would end a year with, you know, um, used to be like a hundred boards in my house every year. Oh my God. And half of them, you know, we never got into and never used at all. Yeah. Um, they, I mean, I, the thing is I was out every day. I didn't, I didn't sit on my ass. I was out riding every single day, shooting every day. I probably, you know, I, I rode almost every different board and wore almost all the clothes and, you know, looked different almost every day. So, you know, um, you know, shots were always getting published, but looked like it was, you know, it was probably all on the same day, but I was always <laughs> wearing something different, kind of thing. So that's rad. That's yeah. That's a, it is a good technique, right? Turn, turn the camera the other way, take put on the other jacket. Yeah, ride someone else's. Yeah, no, but it was it was crazy. I um, you know, after 
you know, after I was done with Burton and after I stopped snowboarding and, and, uh, you know, that was a, a hard, a hard crash, you know, that the change of, you know, these boxes not coming to your house anymore and the checks not coming, you know, it was, um, you know, I was, I was also hungry to go learn something new and to go on to something else. Like I, I, um, I think I get, I've got ADD and I get, I get, it drives me nuts if I'm just doing one thing at one, you know, I got to keep on moving. I got to keep I on doing I have that. I, I didn't yeah. realize it, but I do. I have that. And that's the thing. It's like, I, you know, my wife, you know, <laughs> I drive my night wife nuts cause I do about 50 things at once yeah. and I have the ability to kind of drop something and move on to another, but come back to it. And it doesn't bother me. I don't have Same. this the issue. Yeah. And that's why we have, you know, so many bloody things going on all the time, it seems like. But uh, I, I don't get a panic attack from it. I know people that I drive nuts because I, they just, you know, um, I, they can't just leave things. They, they, they got to finish things. And I have, you yeah. know, I don't mind doing bits and pieces. But anyways, lost, uh, you know, a big um, in the big picture, I just got snowboarding was. What happened at the end? Was there like an episode? Was there something that happened? Was there a contract that ran out and then you wanted to renegotiate and they were like, fuck, dude. You know, it was a bit of a bunch of stuff. Big. After um, uh, this was um, after the Olympics, I ended up breaking my back uh, oh, snowboarding. Shit. And so I had like, um, I mean, it was before. I ended up breaking uh, like three compression fractures in my vertebrae. So I was literally laying uh from snowboarding from snowboarding what, i jumped what? a jumped this dumb cliff and uh and went way too far and landed literally on on flat uphill like so I, you missed you missed the landing oh completely. yeah it was a short little transition and i went yeah. i went like 15 feet past it and oh. landed literally on a cat track it was like maybe in well a groomed cat track and so i was laid out flat i couldn't breathe my diaphragm had collapsed um oh i was God. completely uh, numb so i couldn't feel anything and uh i laid there absolutely you know like stunned and after about 15 minutes i got feeling back in my in my lower body and my i could start breathing oh, and then i got this insane adrenaline rush and i was like um you know i ended up standing up they were at ski patrol were coming for me i ended up getting up and i rode down to the mountain and i went with a broken back I went home and i laid in bed and then uh, you know my roommates are all like you know the few people had heard and they were like you got to go to the hospital and my parents phoned and they were getting involved and i was more afraid of you know what you know what happened really and uh and i was you know young and dumb and and you know what resort was this on? it was on blackham it was up on blackham yeah it was uh and anyways long story short was somebody shooting it like do you have photos of that yeah 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 uh, uh dryden uh dryden parker Bry yeah. dryden parker he was a photographer um uh shot it and uh it wasn't even worth you know it was just one of those dumb things anyways i, yeah. I, I even yeah. said it too yeah. i was like in the middle of the whole thing i'm like ah, i'm not gonna bother and he's like, oh, you're already up there. Just do it. I'm like, oh, oh, okay, sure. God, that's the worst. So always listen to always listen to your inner mind. Yeah, that was, I learned that, that. sucks. But uh, anyways, after that injury, that was a big one. That uh, you know, every cliff I went on to after that, I double thought everything. You had a bit of PTSD. It happens, man. For sure, a, a big injury does that. I think most snowboarders are gonna have that. Oh yeah. And I mean, I had, I had my fair share of little ones, you know, like, uh, I always wore knee braces and ankle braces. I never had knee surgeries. I never had bad knees. I never had ankle. I mean, yeah. I rolled my ankles a couple of times, yeah. Yeah. but I never had an injury that put me out. Like that one put me out for six months. Um, oh, God. I yeah. was, and it was right into one of the best snow years too in Whistler. And I was like, I remember I got to a point where it'd been about five months of, of like, you know, staying at home. And uh, it was dumping every day. And my roommates are coming in saying, oh, my God, it's like the best, you know, best conditions ever. Right. And I remember I grabbed the yellow pages, the white pages, and I grabbed a Sims and a Kemper uh, hip pack. Yeah. And I zap strapped this phone book to my front and to my back and went up with two, you know, and that was my Come brace. On. And, and I slowly got back into it. And that, I mean, I don't know, you know, coming from a back injury, you don't know when to start again. And so I eased, I eased because in. Because doctors will tell you, you're done. The well, doctors say, like, that's it for your career? Well, I mean, luckily, like, what I had were compression fractures. So three of them, uh, two in my lower and one in my upper back, and they ran right to my spinal cord. So all oh. three of them were, like, detrimental. They're all, like, to my spinal cord. So I should have, you know, been a lot worse off than, than I was lucky. Yeah. Um, but um, anyways, I had to give it time. And so, you know, it was about five months, I think. And um, and I moving and, and using it again is what, 
you know, gained all your muscles back. And so, I mean, thank God it was deep pow, because if it was hard packed blower, <laughs> I would have probably, you know, wrecked myself even more. But I rode pow for about a month, uh, one of the best years wow. ever. And, uh, and just, it all came back and muscles got back and, you know, everything was strong, but my mind wasn't. And I was like, you know, um, I, I just, it was a hard one to come back from, you know, I, I still rode for another three more years, but around 2000, 2001, uh, you know, it kind of got to a crossroads. Burton was like, you know, I think we're, I think we're good. And, mm-hmm. you know, I was kind of here nor there about it too. And I, you know, um, so I think I, that was kind of the last, yeah, that was like the last bit. Um, and then I, I, I stayed in Whistler for another year and sort of rode for ride kind of just did a thing with them a friend of mine wrote for them as well and sort of you know spent one more who's that like gabe or, or no it was um uh guy named jamie parker jamie. Um, oh i remember jamie parker yeah so yeah, he Brad. he, he kind of i got involved with them for a little bit and uh we did some th- things with ride and then I, that was i was kind of on the end of it i was kn- i knew that after that season was done i wanted to get to the ride city was kind of transitioning then too i i worked for ride right at that time oh no way yeah and they got bought by k2 and then they exactly. yeah it was like yeah, so Gre- it was a girl named gretchen that was the team gretchen, manager. yeah yeah, 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 yeah matt was the guy that he was the old team manager yeah matt um yeah and that's the those are the guys in the states so in yeah. canada there was i i went to ride canada and then okay. they sent me to ride usa headquarters to learn some bike shit because they also had bicycles <laughs> and oh, yeah. uh, as soon as i landed in seattle because their headquarters are in toronto yeah i landed in seattle and i was like okay i gotta move back to vancouver right you away. went over to the island i'd only that... been yeah i'd only been oh yeah i went to vashon yeah and they showed me that machine that wove the fiberglass around yeah. the cores of the skis and i was like yeah, yeah. these guys are like it was a cool. Everybody's kind of like this. Like we're kids that grew up. Like you guys are like the guys that were really into trucks when you were. And now instead of Tonka trucks, you got a Toyota <laughs> Tundra, or a, or a fucking X5 with a what can, Rush, I can Russian only arm. describe as like the Canadian space arm <laughs> of the fucking. You know that's it's insane what I'm looking at. It it's that's crazy. Yeah, it's fun stuff. And that's amazing. So, yeah, you you know what it is? It's adrenaline again. It is, right? That's uh, my business partner, Jason, who is also a pro snowboarder. He, uh, Jason one, Toft, Jason right? Jason Toth, yeah. yeah. Toth. About, um, you know, this is about six six years ago, about three years into the business. Yeah. We were building drones, and this was early day drones. This is, you know, we we're lifting, you know, full, full cinematic camera packages back about, you know, 2012, 2013. Oh, my God. With wood wood props and and ESCs <laughs> and motors that were just enough power and batteries that were just enough amperage to allow you know yeah everything was just enough and we were just on edge every day we were on a film set we were like because we were hand building the gimbals we were hand building the drones you know you ended a day just drained but it was no different than when you would go out and hike in the backcountry it was that same adrenaline rush cool it sounds ridiculous but no that, it doesn't i it, get it it's the only reason that kept us going we could have yeah. quit so many times there's so many you know things that happened and, and down things and and you know like troubleshooting problems and all that stuff and i think if you if you didn't come from an action sports background where you're addicted to adrenaline and making things happen and, and go 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 i think you would just give up and that was what the early days of drones were in filming in this world. It was just like you, you were you were done at the end of the day. There was so much stress. There was so much you had to like figure out and troubleshoot. I mean, people on sets don't wait. They are, they expect it to work. It needs right. to work perfect, and you got to make it happen. And if yeah. you don't, you got you got forty people looking at you. You know, and their one eyes. of them might be like Robert De Niro or something. So yeah, you're not or he fucking thinks, around. At least he thinks he is. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, 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 exactly. But anyways, yeah. So that that, that was the, the the segue out of the whole thing. I, are um, we in the drone um, renaissance right now? Like, are we in the drone? We're in the thick of it because the whatever movie I just saw, it was a shitty movie. There were way too many drone shots in it. Yeah, I'm like, what in the fuck? Like, I don't need the like establishing shot to come down from outer space to the house. <laughs> like, there, there's a lot of drone shots yeah. in, in movies now. And, oh, like, tons. To the point of where it's almost ridiculous, right? We, we just did a, a movie in Alberta uh, that it started last year. It was with, um, it's coming out on uh, Disney Plus uh, with um, Willem Dafoe. And we did, uh, we did 80 days on that movie of drone, which... You know, we follow a lot of the drone crews around L.A., around the world, you know, New York. And, uh, you know, we're good friends with a lot of the different crews. And, you know, 
everyone does, you know, you get days on Avengers and you get days on X-Men and you get days on, you know, all these movies, but um, uh, 80 days on a movie of drone is like, for us was a record. And for most of the other people we talked to is like, that's just crazy. Um, for sure. I mean, drones are a specific tool. They're a specific shot. They're not for everything. They're not for right. every, you, you don't, you, you know, that's why we got into so many other things as well is because oh, right, it's right, not, right. drone is not always the perfect tool. Uh, people will tell you it is, and then we'll say, no, it's not. And that's what you should use. You know, use the Russian arm, use a cable cam. You know, you've got way too much liability. You've got a stunt guy that's going to get trapped. We can't fly a drone into him. You've got to use this. Right. You know, you got to use something else. And so that's where um, this is This is where the business started up was it? We uh, the background was drone and then Russian arm. And then we just kept on growing into other things to problem solve how to shoot those things safely and and efficient and efficiently and cool. um and that but i you know i had arguments with dops where they were telling me you know well this is what we're going to use and i was like well that's not what we're going to use we're not going to do it you can get someone else to do it but we will not come to this set and put the drone in a position to try and get the shot that you're asking for because this is not the tool for it right and that's an expensive uh, thing and it's and and well, liabilities and oh everything. yeah like fuck it it's it, not the right thing so you got to be that guy you got to crush their dreams. And, and, and that was it. It's like, you know, we said no to a lot of things. And uh, we're, what we learned is we're, we're not trying to be a no. We're not trying to be no people. We're trying to be yes. Mm -hmm. So what, you know, what can we offer? And so that's where we started. You know, we got into, you know, we've got autonomous boats now that we, we've <laughs> constructed. We've got, uh, you know, chase car systems that are a tenth scale that will go just as fast or e-bikes that we'll do chase scenes with. Uh, you know, um, uh, we'd use one wheel skateboards, uh, to do a lot of chase thoughts. Uh, so you'll go, don't tell Sean Kearns, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, we, it's all just about uh, adapting other gear and, and using it to, to make things better. And that's, there is, yeah, every, he's just pointing to all these different things. It's like the, a remote control car. That's like giant, bigger than any remote control car <laughs> I've ever seen in my life. That can obviously go, you know, 100 miles an hour. Oh, yeah. And it just this whole place is just filled with amazing stuff. It's nuts, man. Your life is like, you're like the the kid with all the toys. Yeah, that's what drives the, the wives nuts. You know? Yeah, let's talk about the, let's talk about the side by side with the, uh, with the snow tracks. Yeah. Whose brainchild was that? Well, we, um, we started, uh, there was talk, obviously, Lost in Space that was a, re, a, a show that came back on So this uh, on is on Netflix. Netflix, yeah. On Netflix, yeah. So season one, um, we, you know, we get a lot of our intel from, you know, DOPs and from uh, the grips on set telling us, you know, hey, we got to, we, we have to shoot this stuff. How can we do it? Right. And we're sort of like, our, what our company is trying to be is a, is a problem solving place where, you know, people come to us and say, hey, how can we shoot this? You know, what is the, what is the best way to do it? And if it doesn't exist, can we build it? Right. And, and that's what we started, you know, I'd say about three, four years ago, that became sort of um, where we started developing everything else. And um, and that was where that came in is, um, you know, they knew they wanted to do a lot of chase scenes on snow. You know, they wanted uh, very precise shots. So, you know, it couldn't just be a fixed arm. It had to be able to, to move up and down um, and need to be able to wrap around the object as well. And, you know, drones, we did use drones as well, but for a lot of close stuff drones you can't you can't fly drones you can't just fly it like 600 feet away and then in snow and, and then, at that level of like <clears throat> at the eye level yeah that's was, the thing about the drone shots is that they're always at this weird angle yeah. from way up high it doesn't look yeah. natural it's not like a natural shot no right? that's exactly it i mean you can if you go fast enough uh and you travel with the drone in a chase car you can get nice and low yeah but if you're going slow and low with the drone you have so much rotor wash that you can't mm. you're not so stable oh yeah so that's right. what a russian arm you know is amazing for is uh, you know, have that ability to get a camera and, and keep it stationary, you know, in a person's face driving a car yeah. uh, for long periods of time. And so, Is it hard for you to watch movies knowing, like, like holy fuck, how did they shoot that? Is that how you're watching a movie? It's like, how did they shoot that? Well, even how better, did they shoot that? Even better is, like, that's that's what my wife does now. It's like every time she turns a show on, she's like, oh, is that the Russian arm? Is that the drone? It's like, <laughs> that's what I love <laughs> about her. Amazing. She knows exactly. Uh, oh, that's so cool. Um, but, uh, but, you know, no, that's, that was it. So we, we, um, so the side by side, like, just so people know a side by side is like, kind of like a quad, but like, you've got a lot of times you have two seats. That's why they call them side by sides. Yours has four. Yeah. And then you've got, you can take the wheels off of this and put four 
essentially sled tracks. Yeah, snow tracks. Yeah. So holy it, shit. The system is, uh, and it's a turbo as well because you need the power to be able to drive those. There's a lot of friction on the tracks. Could you go as fast as somebody on a Summit? 800 or something no a sled will go faster but you you get a you get about a i think you can go about 80 so you can go way faster than a snowcat oh like yeah this yeah, could yeah. be the a star to, this, to this, heliboarding what what ace when an a star is to heliboarding this could be that for a cat operation this is like a suburban you could go uh, you could go private right like where you got like a guide and two of you yeah. and a driver it goes about 80 kilometers an hour God in damn, deep pounds. You so. could get crazy laps yeah. when it's socked yeah. in. We should be talking about this for <laughs> like for that. Let's and do a day. Yeah. That, oh, yeah, my God. Are you kidding? Jay will, uh, yeah. like my business partner, he'll. You tell me what pro you want to ride with. I'll fly them do up. It. And we'll and we'll do a day with like your favorite pro. Let's get Jay. Let's get Jay Brown over. Okay, we'll do Jay Brown. We'll, we'll bring sure. him in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's it. we don't even have to fly him, but yeah, we could fly. We talk drones that day too, of them. And we'll talk drones. Okay, <laughs> yeah, let's do it. That'll be the that is. I'm looking forward to yeah. it already. That's like the raddest thing ever. We just got to get snow now. Wouldn't we that need be nice? snow. Yeah. And then Ken Hawk has left PMS, and he's not happy with whoever the people are there. Oh, I didn't know that. So let's just go and go on their tenure and tell them, oh, fuck, what? Yeah. Really? We can't go here? What? What? How about just for one day? Who owns this place? <laughs> we didn't know there's a... Ken told us we're cool. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, that, they'd love that, I'm sure. Exactly. Oh, geez. That's, the, that's Calgary <laughs> coming back. That's the old days. Yeah, we go where we like. No, let's do a day of that, for real. We'll do it. That's yeah. so amazing. Yeah. I'll pay for all the gas. Yeah, yeah. Well, that or we'll get the Baja with the tracks. One of the two. If you make it out to Alberta next, we'll get, uh, yeah. we can get in the Toyota. Unfriggin' believable. Yeah. Yeah, that's nuts. Yeah, no, it's, um, uh, that one will be fun too. But yeah, no, it got us, uh, it was crazy. I remember the first time we ever used it for that, for Lost in Space, we, uh, it, you know, we were in Manning Park shooting and, uh, we were following the moon rover that they use in that, in that show. And, um, I was in the back operating the camera and I had, um, you know, my arm operator was sitting in the front and my driver and we got to the bottom of the, the run and we just, it was the first test actually shooting. We'd done, you know, tests of other things and, but like on the ski resort, filming the actual vehicle was the first thing we shot. And, you know, we built these clear windows of plastic, uh, that, that came down and magnet, you know, the magnetic stuck to the doors. And, uh, I looked over and I had the focus puller who was point focus on the camera sitting beside me. And we were both up to our necks in a snow drift. There'd been so much snow that flew in. And all we were doing was looking at the monitor operating the shot. And when we got to the bottom, I look over and we were both up to our necks. Both of our hands were under. So we had to like air all the electronics had to go in plastic bags oh after. My God. So we had some we had some fine tuning to do on the doors and windows to make sure snow wouldn't come in anymore. But uh, I love Manning Park, too. That's such a fun, yeah. fun little zone. I think any place that's like, you know, that still has those cool. I mean, I, I want to go to Red again, too. I mean, it seems like those ski resorts that still uh, you can still find those little backcountry areas and Mount Baker. Uh, hike to, I yeah, mean, Mount Baker. Yeah, Baker's overrun with people for sure, and the yeah. folks will tell you that it's blown out. But it's fucking so rad yeah. up there. Yeah, yeah. And it feels like they've they've made an effort to keep the lift capacity to the maximum that the mountain can handle. Mm-hmm. They could put high speed quads up there for sure, but what's it going to do? Wreck it all. It just wrecks. It yeah. just means that the there's nothing for anybody that gets there any time after 9 a.m., you yeah. know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, we got there at, like, 9.15 one time, and there was nothing. Yeah. It was gone. Yeah. But, that, yeah, yeah. Those that's when money takes the over. You know, it's like the, the, the glory days of Whistler before all the Harmony chairs went in and the Peak chair went in. Right. I mean, all that stuff was, I mean, you were there in 93. Uh, it, all that stuff was was just amazing. You I know? just didn't know. You didn't. I didn't know what I was getting. Do you know what I mean? Like, I can remember going to Whistler... And being intimidated by like the the pros at Whistler compared to like a pro who was riding around at Seymour or Grouse yeah. was like there could be a bigger spread. I remember riding with Anthony Vitelli, yeah, yeah, and being like, <laughs> "Oh, going this fast is like a thing. I don't really want to go this fast. It's too fast. Yeah, I'd rather go and ride as fast as you can ride at Seymour, which is not that fast. Yeah, and." It, yeah, the peak, the peak to creek leg burners that you oh do with my those guys. God. Eh? Yeah, and like yeah, Mike Strata <laughs> would take me peak to creek, and like I could barely keep up. Mm-hmm. And like just that casual, like, hey, don't go to the left of this because if you do, you'll be lost forever. Yeah, and it's like okay, well, that's fuck, not intimidating. Left of what? <laughs> 
holy shit, just follow my track, man. Yeah. He's like going so fast. How do I, where the fuck is the track? Well, I remember all the, what was it, going off the backside of Peak Chair and you'd end oh, up in uh, the yeah. valley back there and they yeah. come out of the dump uh, two days later, you know. <laughs> two days some later. Some people exactly. didn't live and some people did, but. Yeah, yeah, that's absolutely, yeah, that, and again, so we got that, but I didn't realize how much danger we were in if we hadn't made that that cut off to the little boot pack Kyber, yeah yeah you just like you just don't know oh yeah because everything looks the same like dangerous stuff looks exactly like the not dangerous stuff yeah, out yeah. there you guys must have had some of that with with the sledding in the early days oh yeah there were oh yeah there was some there was some a lot of burly stuff that always happened at revelstoke i remember there was always huge avalanches and we were there and um i i you know, there's one thing I always learned is, uh, you know, it was funny. Someone explained it to me and I was like, obviously it makes sense now. And I'm sure most people know, but you know, you're riding through the trees. If you look forward and you see a treetop right at your eye level, you slam on the brakes. Like, you know, you, you realize you're, you're rolling up onto a cliff band basically. And there that's notorious and rebel stroke. You'll, you go whipping through the trees and all of a sudden you can just be on top of some <laughs> massive, you know, <laughs> cliff ender that goes down into the valley. And that was, um, there was some sketchy stuff. I remember back in the, yeah, in 95, 96 there. But, um, yeah. I don't have the, I don't have the right, I'm, I'm too ADHD to like be safe. That's why I never bought a sled mm -hmm. because I knew I wouldn't ride safely. Mm -hmm. I don't read the instructions. I like take the thing out of the the box and then I like figure it out. Yeah, yeah. So like there's safety stuff. That's why the drone thing has been it's super fun for me, but once I realized how dangerous it is to fly it over a beach full of people. Oh yeah. Like not because they're throwing rocks at it cuz they hate it. That also sucks. <laughs> <laughs> because if it dropped on someone, yeah. you would like you, that's when they tell you you have that's to write you. your name on it you have to you yeah, know yeah. so i yeah i have a i have the gopro karma drone yeah which they discontinued because it's just like there's too many rules obviously yeah. i don't know why they discontinued it every time i open the screen i have to click i agree and that it's like they this won't kill airspace someone. is no that this airspace <laughs> is restricted. Yeah, yeah. You have to say I have obtained a permit. Click it. But like, yeah, they record all that data. Yeah, and they're probably going. Oh, I there's think there's no way. People I think got that. they realized how much work it would. This you know, I think DJI has done so much work with every you know, um, every government uh, aviation sort of you know uh, group about rules and and locking out air you know airspace. And, you know, if you're another drone, you know, provider or builder, you got to go through all that same firmware and software. I mean, DJI has just got the, the money to do it and they've done it well. And I'm, I'm going to get correct. that little as soon as I get my fucking first Vans check, which has been approved and it's oh, being nice. mailed. I'm buying official sponsor, right? Yeah, the That's official, awesome. not even a sponsor, the presenter, oh, they're amazing. the presenting sponsor. Yeah, they're above they're above the title you That's know what awesome. I mean? yeah i'm so psyched on it um they're gonna buy you a drone i'm well essentially <laughs> yeah i was talking with rob about this i feel like my every time i bought a pair of vans my whole life mm -hmm. was like i was plugging this slot machine and now it just hit no it just money, came back right like <laughs> they've now they've all been free right yeah. i mean we're not talking a ton of money we're talking four thousand bucks but four grand to me no, it's awesome. in my life is like a game changer i'm excited yeah yeah and uh first thing i'm gonna do is pay the guys who who wrote the song that's at the, to at oh, the yeah. off the top of the of, because for five years that's been the aesthetic of the of the show yeah um who wrote it it's this guy Evan Cam hmm. and just one of his friends in his. They record it in a garage, Hot Rock Studios up in Whistler. Shout out to those guys. Yeah, that's awesome. And uh, and and I called him and I said, "Hey man, like uh, I want to pay the band for like a hundred bucks a guy for that song." And I'm like <laughs> feeling like, you know, a hundred bucks for a song that they, who do they they don't care, right? Mm -hmm. Um, five guys, 500 bucks. Sure. That's cool. I think it's, like and they can use their drone too. Right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They can use my drone whenever they want. Yeah. Help them shoot the music video. Oh, of course. A hundred percent. 
And he was like, well, it was just me and another guy. I'm like, well, then it's 250 each. And he's like, <laughs> that guy's going to shit, right? Like, and that's what I like. It's like, awesome. I shit over four grand, 100%. Yeah, yeah. This guy's going to shit over 250 bucks. Yeah. Great. That's <laughs> epic. This is, I, I love that shit. So then the second thing I'm doing is I'm buying that DJI. It's not called a Spark anymore. The Mini. Yeah, the uh, Mavic Mini, I think. Mavic right? Mini, yeah, which has all the Mavic features. It's got forward sensors, right? Yeah. So you can't crash it into anything. That's epic. Yeah, it's follow me mode. And, follow me, oh, yeah. right? Right. I can't believe it. Like <clears throat> that's going to change. Like our <laughs> my Instagram posts are going from here. <laughs> They're going to be next level to here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, 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 um, I'm still waiting for the drone that can fly me to the top of a mountain, though. It's, he's pointing at one. He has one that could do it. How dangerous would that be? Um, well, I mean, we're, uh, there's going to have to be some talk with Transport Canada first about uh, that even happening. But you got a dialogue with those guys, don't you? Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, uh, transporting transporting people is a different thing. So that's a whole other. Uh, well, why don't we do that as a publicity <laughs> stunt? Be the first person I to think, ride. Uh, what's his name? Um, oh, what is a uh, guy from New York? Uh, uh, nice dad. Um, I don't know. Uh, yeah, he. Uh, uh, whether this was real or not, they did. Uh, they 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 showed one already. Him being lifted off the ground, which yeah, everyone says it was I all need done to in have, post. But see, I need to have the snowboard on a Dakine backpack sponsored by Dakine, <laughs> and have all my with your gear Vans boots. with my Vans boots yeah. and my you know and and my wired snowboard and and we're <laughs> filming it and. I'm going to be the very first person who was dropped at the top of a mountain by a drone. And then we only need to do one run. Mm -hmm. We only need to do one. Where is it easier to do? Is it, if you can get full, if you can get full, um, permissions from like grouse or Seymour or Cypress, is that easier than doing it in the back country? Yeah, do you think? you'd be better off to go to like a uh, private area. I mean, somewhere like private powder airspace, powder mountain. Yep. Uh, I mean, since you're it since it's tethered it doesn't it, it's tethered it's not a flying object that's that you know it's now held to the ground by a rope as well so it it, it starts to change the rules there but yeah would uh, it be tethered would that be the only yeah. way to do it well if, if you're going to be holding onto it like a t-bar it would be tethered yeah that's that's the the interesting thing i mean if it was well the, somebody if, else has got to fly it i'm not going to be able to fly it yeah and no, do you, you would have stuff. someone else flying it for sure yeah, yeah. i just hold on and go but it could literally you know it could literally be like a drone drone t-bar resort you know you go to drone pump. drop yeah let's do it as proof of concept look mm -hmm. i'm i'm talking you into all sorts of shit that's the problem <laughs> is if you get me in this it's it, somebody's gonna get in a, just well, well, bad bad if news. we can get the paperwork going by that time we'll bring that bad boy out uh when we go out on the on the side oh my side. god we'll do yeah we'll do it all in one and it'll be the you, it'll you can be get, you can get jay brown to fly up there oh my god the most epic day in snowboarding <laughs> history this is the day there's before this day when everybody was on <laughs> sleds and it had to be ground based yeah. unless you're in a helicopter and then there's like a personal drone because that's the next step is that people have these that you program where you're going first run here next run there well, what was that i just saw the um uh audi audi released that ev um uh, basically it looks like a, a side by side it's an audi um like uh off-road car or truck yeah and uh, part of the roof rack system of it are four light drones that launch out of the roof rack and they light the road in front of you. Amazing. Um, yeah. Like, you know, it's crazy what's being integrated into it's everything amazing. now with drones. Yeah. It's. I think these mini ones are going to be a, a big part of a lot of more, a lot more, you know, like secondary photography or whatever, or just following mm -hmm. people. Like influencers are going to be walking around with their, the drone is just filming them oh, everywhere good. they go. We were in. Um, and can do to detect the door and everything can come inside and outside no problem and yeah. deal with wind. We were in uh, in Greece in September um, and uh, we were in Santorini, which is a, like the Banff of all tourist spots there. Yeah. And um, there was, I, you know, everywhere you went there are signs that says no drones no drones oh, yeah. no drones sure and at five in the morning there's every you know every influencer sitting on one of the you know the blue roofed uh houses in santorini with a drone hovering over top for their instagram post oh, that morning my god it's just you know i it, i get blown away by what's the whole yeah it's like sickening right like it's, it's sickening crazy i someone's got to be looking down right now and going you this has got to be the 
most moronic new group of human aliens ever coming off this that's what they thought about us that's totally what they thought about us the guys on the chairlifts watching what we were doing we were idiots too did he hit that fucking shack on purpose (laughs) or was that like because we're lying around on the ground in skiing before that if you were lying on the ground you were bad at it you were on the bunny hill hey you shouldn't be here yet but we were lying around on the ground, hurt, broken back, like in the middle of a run, and we're good at it. It was like yeah. they must have thought we were just insane. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, th- I, I need to say this before <laughs> the, the moment passes. Graham Cam, who's Evan Cam's brother, the, the guitar player guy, mm-hmm. um, when he, he was trying to get me to buy a sled, and I was saying I'm not buying one until the, it's a drone thing, It I, I can't wait to tell him, like, I'm one step closer in reality to this could actually happen. There's a drone five feet from me that could lift me up. I'm not fucking around. Like when you put an idea out into the world, that's the only way it can come true Mm -hmm. is if you actually believe that this can happen, it can happen Mm -hmm. eventually. I mean, I'm not going to hold you to it. Like you got to put a T bar on that and we got to go, but at least I put the idea in your mind. Oh no. It trust me two two snowboarders that own this company. That was the first thing that came to our mind as well. (laughs) Of course. Yeah, no, it's about whether or not we have time, but no, that, that would be, uh, it's not whether or not it could happen. uh, It's about whether or not you have time. That's unfucking believable. it, It could easily happen. That's more about, Doing All right, it. we're raising Do- money through this show. Any <laughs> listener that wants to see this happen, start sending money. Could be the next Vans ad, too. You know, we fly the, the riders up to the top of the hill. There you go. Oh, yeah. There's some team manager right now listening to that going, oh, don't waste it on Eric. <laughs> we got a team rider that we're paying good money that could make that run look good. Yeah. yeah no, that, unfucking believable It'll happen this year. <laughs> that, that, that'll definitely happen this year. That's unreal. Let's do it. Let's yeah, do yeah. it for sure. Do you want to keep going or do you want to get to family stuff? Yeah, no, I'm, I mean, no, I'm good. I th- okay. I feel, I feel like we didn't talk that much about your snowboarding career and the trajectory of like all the mm-hmm. stuff that you did. I, I also feel like you as a snowboarder, a lot of Canadian snowboarders, that kind of limits you a little bit. I feel like you were like an international snowboarder. You weren't just like. Like, I don't get the feeling that you were on trips as, like, a token Canadian. You were, like, Burton A-team guy. Yeah, I mean, I mean, there was, um, um, yeah, kind of. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I mean, I, I was definitely at one point when, you know, we were at the catalog shoot in whatever New Zealand, and I was like, you know, I'm surrounded by all the guys that when I was a kid and, you know, uh, in 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 school, like, flipping through the Burton catalogs going, down. this looks awesome, and, you know, now I'm, in you know with all these guys and hawking and you know uh, uh i mean there was just there were t- gucci and i mean there was jay brown and joe curtis and i mean the, the whole team was um you know craig kelly i mean the amount of times i got to do things with him too i just you know lucky um you know it, I, I was lucky that's all i can say it was, yeah it when was, you mentioned mark gallup i was like oh this guy's room with craig and then i'm like oh, oh yeah. yeah fuck we we did a um one of the i mean after that i went back to island lake lodge so many times for for different shoots and uh so i got you know i got to you know i got to meet craig tons of times and obviously on burton stuff i got to see him and um we had a uh there was a really funny time we were <clears throat> there was a transwood story that was uh being shot and me and Gallup, and I can't remember who else was on this trip, but we were all going to the interior. It was a brand new cat operation that was opening up. And um, Craig was at Iron Lake Lodge, and that's where I first met Gallup, you know, before we left on this trip. And, right. And so, you know, a couple couple nights of, like, hanging out with Craig and his photographer that was there at the time. And, um, you know, he's like, well, you know, what are you guys up to right now? I'm like, oh, you know, we're going to go into the interior and we're going to go, you know, shoot at this new – this new cat operation that's opening up and they just have these like yurts right now. And, you know, they're going to start growing into a big resort. Um, and he's like, Oh, that's, that's cool. You know, like, where is it? And I, you know, I told him like, you know, I think it's like somewhere here, there and there and whatever. And, um, and then the next day we got up and, uh, you know, I was shooting with Gallup around I like lodge and we came back down that day and, and Craig wasn't there and nor was this photographer. And, and we stayed one more day, and then we left Iron Lake to go on the trip, now the Transit trip. And as we pulled into the—and we had driven for about, you know, seven hours to the interior, somewhere outside of, like, Big White. Um, 
and I can't remember the name of the, the cat place. It's probably a big place now. Yeah. And we went down this logging road. You had to go about 5K off the highway down this logging road to get to the, the lot where the cats would pick us up and bring us up to these, like, coal-fired, you know, like, yurts. They had, like, heating oil in them and stuff. Like, it, was, it was a real rugged place, but, man, the train was insane. Yeah. But we pull up in – as the turnoff off the highway, we pull up, we go across one bridge, make a left, and there's Craig in this broken-down van – um, he, he had to change a tire like his tire went flat and we're like what the fuck are you doing here and Mark just jumped down he's like Derek you told him where we were going I'm like wait well, yeah he was just asking Craig just had this smile on his face he's like and that's what Craig did you know he he was the pioneer you're not gonna go first he's going first oh, and so he found oh, out where man. it was he went and rode rode the piss out of these places yeah um, and he and told, they shot, they oh, shot oh, photos. He got like, the, oh yeah, 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 got yeah. the article. Well, it wasn't an article. Um, like his thing was more about shooting for himself. The article we uh, did after. Yeah. But when we got and woke up the next morning and we were at the resort and they're like, you know, there's all these lines on all these epic places. Yeah. And they're like, yeah, Craig did all that. And we're like, <laughs> oh my God. And that's, you know, that's the kind of guy he was. He was, um, uh, we, I got, yeah, we did a bunch of stuff with him. We did a, a day um, back. He in, was driven, right? Like oh, he yeah. was, like he just was. He was like me with the drone, thinking like he's thinking. He's thinking about snowboarding because that's his job. He was crazy, yeah. He, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, he used to drive all the way from his place up here in BC to Chile every year in his van with his girlfriend. Uh, I mean, that's yeah. The, I watched a movie of that. Like they filmed it one year. Yeah, and put together an that's edit. a burly drive. I mean, that's. I mean, and then you know, to, I mean, he, he had such a passion for for snowboarding. It's you know, that's and all surfing he wanted to too. Do. Actually, on yeah. those trips, you'd see it. He he had that van was all wheel drive. I think and yeah. there was at one point they get stuck and they're putting like boards down and like the local kids are helping and there's mud flying everywhere. Yeah, yeah. He was an adventurer, man. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, he would definitely not chicken out on some road. Is someone says, "Oh, that road's gnarly and it's washed out in one spot." He oh, would yeah. go. He would go. Yeah, yeah, that's fun. Did Did you get like some epic riding trips with him too? Or yeah, we did. Um, uh, we did a show back in the day, um, a pilot show for. It never came to fruition, but it was a show about snowboarders taking like uh, musician snowboarding. Oh, cool! And so we, me and Craig, uh, took uh, James help from uh, Metallica Jesus. down to uh, Steamboat uh, Steamboat Springs, or uh, they had a cat operation, Steamboat Cat in Colorado. In Colorado, yeah. Oh, so we we went my to um, God. we went to we went there. Took James and his bodyguard uh, snowboarding the you know for the day, and it was fucking bodyguard. hilarious. <laughs> oh yeah, it was. This great. is what snowboarding was, you guys. <laughs> was Craig Kelly, Derek Height taking James fucking Hetfield and his bodyguard snowboarding? Yeah. Did he just get beat up? Did he get oh beat yeah, the he, fuck up? you know what? He was actually really good. He um he also uh, he's an avid like uh, wakeboarder too. So oh, he, cool. He's good at standing sideways. Yeah. Um, but no, he did he did great. And then uh, that day uh, he. I remember he went back to the airport, flew down to Denver, and I hopped in. Uh, we had Brad McGregor as well filming, and cool. uh, uh, we had uh, Curtis Corey was shooting photos. And then uh, we hopped in a car, and I hopped in with Craig, and we drove back down to Denver that day, uh, that night for the Metallica concert. Oh no way! So we, you know, I and if, if the one thing you never do is you hop in a car with Craig. I'm mean, Craig was just a crazy driver, man. He was like, I was scared for my life. Good driver. <laughs> guy obviously is you know he never gotten bad accidents but boy we were driving way too fast uh but got down to this this uh concert um in denver and um uh they put us right in the front row and i remember like when the when the show started you know the, it was like uh the concert started and the lights started flickering and then it was like this big power problem or they made it look like it was a power problem and then james got up on stage and and he just said you know hey denver how's it going and you know he's like um he's like you know if I'm standing kind of funny up here, it's because these two fuckers took me snowboarding today. And, you know, yes. points at us two and we're like, no way. And oh, so my God. Concert was epic. And then after the concert, we went to um, a, a church. It was an abandoned church turned into a bar. And uh, the whole upstairs was all like the VIP. So we were just partying with like the whole the whole band. Uh, all Like the whole group of us was all partying with the oh band upstairs. Oh, my God. It was one of those things where like, you know, the 
the, how those guys live in their whole world, it's like that is a whole nother level again. It's oh, just, totally, right? Like, totally. You partied with Metallica? <laughs> it's pretty funny. And Craig Kelly? Yeah. That, I, I don't, I'm, yeah, and I was, I'm speechless. That was a big trip. That was definitely like, uh, that was a pinnacle, pinnacle trip for sure. Yeah, I talked to one of his college friends, like his college roommate, best friend guy, yeah. and um, Kruger. Jeffrey Kruger. Okay. And they, they, no matter where Craig was in the world, he, there was a group of them that would get together and go see Judas Priest. or Like, they were headbangers. Yeah. They were, like, fucking... So, getting to see Craig in his element with... <laughs> God, oh, yeah. That's nuts, dude. When that's when... He just blew my mind. When they did the... Um, uh, James ended up doing all the narration to his movie. That's right. Yeah. He did. Oh, that's that That connection. was the connection. Yeah. I remember being like, where did that even come from, from Let It Ride? You that's know what it, insane. It was... Um, uh, so Jacques Rousseau, who was the yeah. Adventuroscope uh, owner, he... Mm -hmm. It was his connection. He knew James's like, manager. And that was the first sort of connection that brought... Oh, you know, interesting. That brought the two together. So... Um, that's so, crazy awesome. Yeah. Well, I got a pitch for you now on tape here. I, I talked about it a couple of episodes ago with TJ Snyder. Mm -hmm. I And everybody's got this idea. So listeners, you've had it. I know. But I want to do comedians in cars getting coffee with snowboarders at resorts getting powder. So <laughs> you talk to the resort. You get their permission to pick a run. Yeah. So a local rider from that mountain who's like a famous rider sure. gets to pick their favorite run on their favorite mountain. And then the, we wait for a powder day where it's nice and bluebird. They keep and we, it closed. They keep it closed. Cool. So they give us access before they open it. They just give us a half hour before opening cool. where we got patrollers. And then it's got to be two filmers, the host who I thought I would be the host. Mm -hmm. And Devin Walsh was like, I want to be the host. Well, that was so pretty sick, too. That's, as soon as it was Devin, it took me a couple <laughs> days to like <laughs> swallow my pride and be like, I guess I got to be like a DOP or something. I don't know. Oh, you can be the producer. I could be the producer. Yeah. Devin, it's got to be Devin. Mm -hmm. Because Jerry Seinfeld to comedians mm -hmm. is what Devin is to snowboarders. If he showed up at your door... You would have a second where you're, you're going like, to say yes. Holy fuck, it's Devin fucking Walsh. I can't believe I'm riding my favorite run. Yeah. Like, because the thing that's happened to snowboarding is that you don't get that anymore. Mm -hmm. We used to go to a resort on a pow day. And if you got there at 10 or 11, you were the first one there. You got to bag whatever lines you wanted. Mm -hmm. Now it's like you get there at 8. They don't open till 9. And you got to pick one line, you know what I mean? Because there's enough people to track the mountain in an hour. It's going to get shot, yeah. So just having that throwback to the good old days where you could have your, you could have million dollar trees from the top. Yeah. To the, million to the dollar trees, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And you could, and and the show and writes itself, right? Because you talk about that run and mm -hmm. what it means to you and what it was like back in the day mm -hmm. and you hype up the resort. So I think the resorts are going to pay for it. Mm -hmm. I'm going to cut all this out because somebody's <laughs> going to steal this fucking idea. Copyright, I like it. Trademarked. No, it's, I, it's a doable pilot, right? We want to shoot the pilots this year for real. Devin's already signed on. He's in. I, I He'll like do it. it. So get James in there. Get and James Hetfield. <laughs> Be awesome. Holy yeah, shit. I like it. Yeah. That, that's good. That's really good. Well, uh, the, the reason I knew that it would work was because I was talking with Rankwood about some other thing. And I said, I want you to be on the show. And I just told him what I told you. Mm -hmm. I'm like, where would you want to go? Thinking in my head, duh, Baker, Baker obviously. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. He's like, a Oz. And I was France. like. France. Yeah, dude. Yeah. Of course. He's like, there's only one, there's only one place I'd want to do that. He's like, France, of course. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. I was like, that's what the show is. Obviously. Yeah. Like that it's like there's like money being thrown off because we <laughs> there's enough money to fly Rankwit and a crew yeah. to France to shoot this fucking unbelievable show. That's what. What is this? The 90s again where there's lots of money? Right. Yeah. Because <laughs> we're talking. this. We've already sold it to Netflix. That's what I, in my brain. All right. We've sold it to Netflix. Disney Plus actually. Disney got Plus. Money now, yeah. All right. Well, there you go. We go. <laughs> It's a great show for I love Disney it. Plus, right? Like it would, it fits their brand you for know, sure. I know who can shoot the aerials for you if you guys, if you guys want to do it. Yeah, I think we'd have to have aerials, wouldn't we? Yeah, yeah. We get the razor out there too. I think we would need that for <laughs> almost every episode. That's oh my god! It's like um, we can make this. It could be like a tech 
a tech twist to this too. Tech twist for sure. Oh my God, totally. Oh yeah, you could have like the little blurb where it's like, we shot this with this and then there's a bit of like behind the scenes for that. That would be really cool actually. Or we just don't even use the chairlift at all and we just you bring bring the toys to oh get people. Oh my God, could you imagine? Oh yeah, we also have a drone that'll fly you to the top. <laughs> no, who's going to do the drone? Like it would be a rock, paper, scissors for who has to fucking... I like it. Hold on to the drone. <laughs> oh, that is awesome, man. That's cool. Yeah, that's it, I. It's an idea that came out of my brain talking with um, Rob Dow. Oh yeah. And when I actually pitched it to Devin, he's like, "I already had that idea. <laughs> it's my idea. <laughs> it's not your idea." So you're but you're, you're, you're a producer though. Well, now mm. in in the original one, I was the host. <laughs> <laughs> How do I get the producer doesn't get to ride the run. I have to ride the run. So what other yeah. what other um mm. <laughs> there's no other I can't be the pro rider. I can't be Devin. I can't film. Are you can you give me a crash course on on tail guide follow cam? Oh yeah, we'll get you a movie and uh All right, that's yeah, what I do. Sick, I'm that guy. Sick follow cams off the booters. Okay, I'm that guy. Yeah. I like it because <laughs> I have to do the run. Like there's no point in me being involved if I don't get to ride that mm-hmm. untracked. Right. Oh, if there's no <laughs> pal for you, then don't do the show. It's not worth <laughs> it. It's in my rider or whatever it is. It's in my contract. I got to get that. Now, maybe there'll be one track in it before they go. And that's my track. Yeah. We'll have to get some sponsors on this. Yeah. That's the thing. Hmm. I mean, not really. It's you could shoot the pilot with just you know the, it, it's not that I mean it's involved obviously the France part will get expensive <laughs> <laughs> the pilot will be cheap here we'll do it in Whistler and I'm sure we got a contact there yeah I was thinking yeah actually Devin has a contact there yeah so he's got a direct line to I think he rides for them so oh yeah he's got, got yeah. a veil thing going on eh I think so oh crazy yeah. he's a he's he deserves every he's got fucking thing that he's got. Oh, yeah. You know what I mean? Like, there's there's only one Devin. Oh, yeah. Son, fucking real. You were close, though. We'll give you that. No, he, oh, no. <laughs> Devin was Devin. There is no, uh, that was, yeah. Everyone looked up to him. Was he in your era, though? Yeah, I was, I mean, that, that West Beach, uh, that West Beach that I'm thinking about, like, over Hawkins was there, and, mm-hmm. and um, uh, where they had that border cross, that first one, that West Beach. Uh, Devin was there too, and he had like I remember he showed up with a twin tip, twin tip barfoot. It was I think that was his uh, pro model that year. He his, did, he never had a pro model. It was John Boyers. It was John Boyers. Yeah, and it was cut down. He didn't. Here's the thing I've asked him about it because Weird. he didn't get he didn't get much from Chuck. He wanted it, but he just didn't get it. It wasn't until he was on. Oh, it could have been his never pro model. His first pro model was never one. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But no, I'm pretty sure that was a bar foot that he yeah. was on during yeah. the West Beach contest. I, I've seen photos. Like, I think Daniel was shooting photos at that contest yeah. of him there. Yeah. Which is, I feel like. Yeah, it, yeah, it's just sick style. I mean. His style was like, it was just standout, right? Yeah. Who's that? Is, yeah. He was one of those guys. He was yeah, a no. who's that guy. Yeah. Yeah. There's Jamie Lynn and Devin. They're like their own two little pockets of styleness that no one else could touch. Yeah, yeah. It's like, and Peter Line had his own quirky style at yeah. that point. That was fun. Oh, yeah. I remember when Peter came to, what was it, the Booter on Black Home when he started doing all those backside rodeos. Yeah. Uh, that, yeah, that was, yeah, that was a huge, uh, huge part of snowboarding. That, that, I mean, when he showed up to Whistler and started doing that, uh, or Black Home. Is that where they filmed some of that Trans World video where the Trans World had four videos that one year? There was a, a booter on the front side of Black Home that um, uh, Peter, yeah, Peter was doing, like, I remember it was, I don't know if it was for a photo shoot or what they built it for. It was a contest maybe. Yeah. But he it was on a training day or something, and Peter started throwing down, you know, all the backside rodeos, and everyone was just like, what is this? What is it? What just happened? Yeah. Um, Isn't that fucking that awesome? Huge, yeah, that was a huge, Yeah. I remember Risto Scott at the yeah. at a uh, Risto was killing it. It too. might have been at that same contest, yeah. huh? I don't know if if Peter was at that one because I I rode in like some Kokanee Big Air that they did up there. Yeah, I don't think Peter was there for the Kokanee Big Air, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but no, he was. He did ride that jump the week before or something. Right. He, I, I distinct I distinctly remember that he was there, 
And I remember seeing that trick for the first time and going, like, oh, God. That was right around then because Risto Scott was yeah. doing it, but he was hucking yeah, it. Yeah. It was Risto's like a hawk. Yeah. yeah, that was a pinnacle moment for me. Yeah, That oh, was yeah. when I graduated from the ladies' jump to the big jump <laughs> and went from, like, spinning on the ladies' jump to just a straight air. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to – because you couldn't be in the contest – and hit the ladies' jump. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, they called it the ladies' jump too. I remember that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and I'm like, I <laughs> still kind of feel like maybe hitting the ladies' jump might be for me. I don't. Is that kosher to call it the ladies' jump? This Not thing? anymore. Yeah, yeah. God no. Then they don't even have that anymore. Yeah, the girls hit the jump. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, There's yeah. no like compensating. Yeah, yeah. Saying, oh no, no, girls can't go as big. Girls can. They. And oh yeah. That's where they're at now. Yeah. Kick my ass. Oh my God! Kicked every they could kick everybody's ass. Yeah, yeah. isn't it crazy? We're not at parity yet, but it's coming. It's great. I mean, you know what's crazy is it's crazy how fast you can lose it if you don't ride every day anymore, and you don't, uh, you yeah. don't keep that that level of like uh, uh, adrenaline and anxiety in your system, and you go out and you're mm-hmm. like just you know show up. You're just like. Did I used to do that? Like, what, what happened? <laughs> it's just kind of sad, actually. Yeah, I've I've had it on my on my personal level. Just like you lose tricks. Yeah. Oh, so yeah. you you go out that your last couple of days of the year when it's sunny and slushy, you got all this stuff that you're like, yes, and then you go up the first day of the next year and you're like, I don't have anything. No, <laughs> I, don't, I can't even straight air that. I'm I'm gonna start with side hits again. Like you start over. <laughs> Oh, it's the old nuts. hit runs. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm looking forward to that this year, actually. Yeah. Fun. How often do you still snowboard? Yeah. If we, you know, I, just to take my daughter now. We, yeah. We, he's shaking his head, and uh, I'm thinking about his daughter. Uh, it, like, it, it's yeah. When you have kids that age. Yeah. I mean, I you know what? That's it's, what it is. It's watching her go now. Um, makes me stoked. But uh, I usually only go up when we have a job to you know we got to follow someone and like do a you know a follow gig. I'll go and hop on the board and grab the camera. Red. But um, it's like I usually will if if I got time off I'll go surfing. Unfortunately now. Well, it's lower impact for sure. Yeah, it's just. Yeah. I'm. I mean, not for me. I've. I'm just tense out in the water. I can't I'm paddling into things. I'm freaking out. Oh yeah. 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 I. It, I don't know. I've, I've. Surfing to me is like. I mean, it, it's getting busy out there too. So it kind of right. it's losing that. But that's sort of like you know, there's no one out there. You got your own little zone. And where's your spot? You go down to Mexico or. Um, we have a, uh, we go to Costa Rica. We got a place down there. Oh, so wonderful. we'll go down for, you know, a couple, like six weeks of the year down there. Are you anywhere near where Kevin Young was at? Um, funny, uh, Kevin, we bought our place back in 2000 and, uh, Kevin, when he started going down, he's up North, uh, we're down South. Yeah. Uh, me and DCP have a place. Oh, sick. Man. And so, uh, we're way down South. Mm-hmm. And, uh, but the first time Kevin came into the, into the country, we were at a hotel by the airport and him and his girlfriend or wife came through, and we're all at the same place. We're, hey, what are you guys doing? Like, oh, shit. we're gonna go up north and get a place. And I was like, no way. And, but yeah, sure enough, they uh, you know they they moved up north and they were there for quite some time. And yeah, uh, every I mean, we go down every Christmas. We ran into a crew uh, last year in um, heading home. Uh, we were at an airport uh, hotel at the airport, and um, uh, these you know this cool couple that were just had some kids, and our kids are playing with their kids, and they're talking about. You know, uh, oh, we're up in up in the north part of Costa. I'm like, oh, cool. I'm like, you guys ever run into Kevin Young? They're like, uh, yeah, they're like our best friends. I'm like, oh, rad. Pretty funny. It's a small world yeah, when it comes small to small world. You it's know who small. else lives just uh, where we are down south? Um, is Yan Wah, Michelle Taggart. Oh, they, sick. They, they own a, um, uh, a retreat up in the mountains, like way, way up in the mountains. They built this cool little... Um, well, like, here's another seed of idea. Now I have to go there. I'll interview <laughs> interview them. down there. But see, if I if I pay to go stay at their place, they'll just have to do it out of respect, <laughs> right? Like, oh, okay, you got your. Oh, they'll host, yeah, yeah. That'd be fun, man. And there's actually a cool little hill. There's like, a, um, I mean, barely a hill. I would. Go. Yeah. There's these mountains, uh, a mountain pass that comes from San Jose down to where we are, and uh, in December sometimes you'll get snow up there like there'll be like a hailstorm in costa so you rica could maybe bring your board and do a little for about half an hour before the the, yeah, the sleet yeah. melts again yeah, yeah yeah that's my style see i can ride that stuff all day long <laughs> if it's you know something bigger and go for a surf the same day yeah that'd be oh man that sounds so fun yeah how long how so you've been going there since 
before 2000. Yeah, pretty much that was part of the the inevitable leave from snowboarding too was uh, I got um, Oh yeah, you and DCP were on the team at the same time. See, now I just think well, of he, him as yes. He was quite a bit younger than me. Uh, right. But when I was But he was the young guy on the, t- yeah. the team, right? He he talked about when when it switched for him at Burton was at some photo shoot in Europe somewhere. Mm-hmm. They weren't even invited to the team shoot. He was just so hungry. He was still. He's like, oh, they're going to be there. He's like pushed and got in. Yeah, and he just he just went wound up there, and then he got some of the shots in the catalog just by being there. You probably would have been at that shoot. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I can't remember which one. Uh, the, the turnaround was right around that time when I was getting out of it too. Yeah. Um, oh yeah. Two thousand one. Everything just crumbled. Changed. Yeah. Or it didn't crumble. It just like that was. It's like okay, old contracts are out the window. We're gonna renew, but with like new people that don't have any idea what just fucking happened. Cause oh yeah. We don't. We can't have people with contracts like that anymore. Yeah. It's just not viable. Yeah. Yeah. I know that was it too. I mean, when I got when I got out, um, I, that was the other thing. It was like surfing. I was like. Yeah, uh, Dave Downing uh, got a, got me like hooked. We we'd Sweet. always we'd always go down to Southern California before we'd go to Japan or whatever on trips, you know, with a crew. And uh, he took me surfing for the first couple times down in Cardiff and pushed me into waves. And I was like, okay, now I'm hooked on this. And right. so whenever we go to Japan or whatever, I always try and find a little surf, you know, whatever. But that was it. When when I got out of snowboarding, it was all about surf, surf, surf. Yeah. Um, and, uh, it, it, yeah, I mean, that's, I don't know. It, it's just, it, would it's you, something different. Would you surf one of those wave pools if you looked into that thing? I would, yeah, for sure. Yeah. yeah. I, I mean, think Kelly Slater's looks like it's the best it's one now. You, you, you seen that steampunk one, that crazy one that they made? It's like this massive, um, oh, yeah. cylindrical <laughs> ram. Yeah, yeah. That's pretty cool, yeah. too. Yeah. What the hell is that? I mean, it makes good waves, right? But it uh, makes good waves about, yeah. This high. Yeah, I don't think any of them are like, you know, double overhead barrels or, you know, are close to it yet. Not but, yet, uh, but I think they can get there. Yeah. Yeah, I think they can get there. It's what it sounds like. I've been listening to Mark Ocalupo's podcast. He's so rad, dude. Yeah. Unfucking believable. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I don't know anything about surfing, but just like hearing him talk to the legends. You'll get hooked. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I, the thing, oh yeah, actually, I will get hooked in wave pool surfing because the thing for me is I'm scared to death of like sharks and orcas and oh, yeah. fish, even jellyfish. Fuck that shit. <laughs> <laughs> I hate that stuff. Yeah, when they bite, that's not good. Yeah, no. But uh, yeah, and I just can't get it out of my mind. I'm like constantly like yeah, yeah. scared when I'm. And the currents, the current seems to all like if it's pounding, there's a huge current. And you just get sucked way out back, and yeah, then everybody's yeah. watching it. It's it's like a very public shaming. Yeah. It's like there goes that guy. He doesn't know what the fuck he's doing. You know what? It's fun though. Like that that sort of uh, that little bit of whatever sketchiness. Yeah. I, I love that stuff. You know, you're getting out, and all of a sudden there's big waves, and you got to duck dive. Oh god! And then you're getting pulled over. To, it's like. Yeah. I hate that. I like it. I I, <laughs> I want the wave pool. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, 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 yeah. I can, and by no means do I think that a wave pool – actually, let's be honest. I think I could just get in a wave pool and do it. Mm-hmm. It looks like when it's – when you know what's going to happen well, and you can watch it a few times. It's always going to happen in the same place. And it's always going to be the same spot. Like, okay, put me there. Mm-hmm. I, I'll do it. Mm-hmm. Like, I feel like that's what wave pools are going to do to surfing. going to totally ruin it because yeah, a kook well. like me – is no longer afraid to go. <laughs> yeah. Well, and then everyone's going to get the same level. It's all going to be the same. It's... Yeah. Is that how you feel when you watch, like, do you watch snowboarding now, like Olympic snowboarding and stuff like that? Yeah, yeah, for sure. And, I mean. And do you feel like, wow, that's just, all that shit is crazy? I, I mean, it, progression has to happen. It's, yeah. It can't stay, it can't just stay where where it was, but it's, um, it's like a whole nother level. I mean, seeing like, you know, Mark and, you know, McMorris and, uh, just where that's all going is just, I mean, I, I, you know, when I started, I don't think I would ever thought it would ever get to that point. Yeah. Because how ha- can go in huge, right? Like remember those days mm-hmm. where he would just do like three giant straight airs or mm-hmm. three giant small spins or Michael Chuck. Were you there for Michael Chuck oh, yeah. stuff? Oh yeah. Grew up, grew up in, uh, you know, oh, going, yeah, going to COP and, uh, of course. every, every other night, you know, Michael Chuck would come out, uh, out of the bush, out of the pipe and just... <laughs> You know, after digging this crazy little thing in the pipe, and he had his hat on with a string tied down, and he would just boost. <laughs> oh yeah, no, Mike was a classic too. 
Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, I'm. I'm. He's agreed to do the show, but it's been. Oh. I've been chasing him for like three years. Say hi to him for me. I will for sure. Yeah, he's, good, good, he's really good memories of that guy. I can tell you that much. Yeah, yeah. You guys grew up together. He's a couple of years older than you. Um, no, I think I, I don't know if we're the same age or maybe he's a, he's a little bit younger. Oh, okay. Oh, wow. But he was all. Yeah. I mean, COP. Like you know, I, I, when you finish school in Calgary every night, you go to the pipe. There was Al Clark. There was you know Michael Chalk or Tim. Tim Nelson or Paul Nelson or Hugh Fraser, like there was like the whole that's a rag crew. No, it was it was it was hilarious. Todd Bowman, John Boyer. I mean, like I oh wow, I remember Boyer teaching me how to how to ride. Um, well, I can't remember we were doing like one eighties out of the pipe or something. You know, like just sure, sure. It's just crazy the, the 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 people I got to grow up with that were part of those magazines and that early ISM magazine. You know, the guys that were in that stuff, and it just. That's yeah. amazing. Yeah. Do you have you worked with Boyer now? He's oh no, he's a screenwriter, yeah. right? I worked with. Um, we did. I, funny enough, when I when I got out of snowboarding, Boyer is who I went to Costa Rica with him and a bunch of friends, and then we ended up, ended up finding. Uh, yeah, I ended up finding a place down there, and we, we ended up buying. But uh, um, I was friends with Boyer for quite some time. After that, we you know we. Um, we did a Kelly Slater commercial in uh, in Hawaii. Cool. We got to hang out with Jack Johnson and Kelly. No. So Boyer was the DOP, and I was his, I was a camera guy helping him uh, load film and stuff. So we hung That's out, amazing. Hung out in the North Shore and watched Pipe Masters uh, the year that Kelly was supposed to win, and yeah. he didn't win. Uh, it was it would have been the seventh consecutive, I think, or something. But um, uh, yeah, I had some fun times with Boyer. He was uh, uh, always, you know, I always looked up to him when I was a kid and he taught me, taught me a lot about the, the snowboarding side. And then he taught me a lot about the film side as well. He was and in that, it, that very first snowboarding movie that got my attention was uh, into the snow zone, which I think oh, yeah. was a ski movie. Yeah. And there was a snowboard rap, section, rap films, rap films yeah, yeah. with the narration. I can still hear the, that's the voice I'm doing when I'm here, actually, <laughs> John boy air. And, and if you, ever was, get, if you ever get Boyer on this podcast, you got to get him to do his uh, Warren Miller. He's yeah. got the best. Warren Does he? Oh, yeah. 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 God. Yeah. I'm going after him for sure. Yeah. I love the guy. He, Say hate him to me. Yeah, I will for yeah. sure. It was, um, because in that there was Warburton, Don Schwartz, and Boyer, and Boyer stood out as the guy that you wanted to be, man. Like yeah. scruffy hair, good style, good, a great style, just going yeah. for it. Yeah, yeah, that. And they were, no, they weren't all on barfoots. I think, but he Warburton had that, was that twin, that twin Burton. barfoot. That was like a big. That was a big thing at the time it was too. Super sick. Yeah. yeah, yeah. His style was sick, and they were hitting <clears throat> fucking legitimate cliffs in the backcountry. Yeah, probably eighty eight, maybe eighty seven. Yeah. Yeah, maybe even been. '86. Who knows? Like a long time ago. Yeah, Boyer. Yeah, he's doing well. He uh, the last time I talked to him, he was um, he was involved in a lot of big LA things. He so. his screenplay got like he won some awards with with a screenplay yeah. that he wrote, which is sick. Yeah. And yeah, it's he's crazy. he's an LA guy. Yeah, yeah, it's nuts. Living I mean, at the he... bottom of Hollywood Hill, I guess, right below the sign. <laughs> really? Yeah. Last time I saw him. He well, was... that's now I know how to get him. I'm yeah. going down to Cal. <laughs> Actually, I should reach out to him now. I'm going to California in a couple of weeks. Oh yeah, I do for sure. Yeah, yeah, that'd be fun. That'd be a really, really nice one to. Yeah. He, he's on my bucket list. Like, like I said, first snowboarder I ever looked up to. Like, yeah, I want to be like that. I, I want to be cool like that guy. Yeah, yeah, and. I I missed the style thing. Now as as an adult, I have a, a better handle on it. As a kid, it was just like I don't know. It was kind of like Luke Skywalker was the first one for me. And now when you look back, like guys that like Luke were like dorky. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? That that I'm like kind of that dork that likes the that guy. Yeah, yeah. As a, I remember my friend like Boba Fett, and I'm like, oh, he's probably <laughs> like Satan too. You know, and yeah. he's like, actually, yeah, I'm a part of the Kiss Army. I'm like, figures. Hilarious. I like Duran Duran because <laughs> they're the coolest, right? Yeah. Anyways. <laughs> yeah. That's a crazy way to end it, but I think we got what we got, right? And with Boba Fett. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, no, it's awesome. Thank you for being on the show. Oh, yeah, thanks for having Is me. Is there anything, you don't need to shout out anything. You got every sponsor in the book. If you're sponsoring yourself with the biggest <laughs> toy shop in the world. Well, I can definitely say thanks. Uh, snowboarding definitely was, a, went, to me, was a huge uh, a huge positivity to my, to my life. It was like, I know there's so many parts of snowboarding uh growing up in a new sport or you know the 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 ability for anything to happen that whole that whole thing that, that happened in snowboarding and learning uh how to run things how to do things it's like i i learned i learned so much from the industry it was like uh you know 
I wouldn't, I couldn't imagine if, if I'd never found snowboarding, I don't know where I'd be right now. Right. You know, it's, it's changed everything. I've done, you know, everything I've learned after I went, you know, finished snowboarding, it's, it's been a, it's been a part of everything I've done. So it's, uh, it's, um, yeah, we're lucky to have been where, where we were, when we were, I can tell you that much. It was, uh, those were good times. Yeah, for I'm sure. I'm sure the kids these days are having fun, but I don't think they knew anything of what we got. I mean, those were, those were epic. Those were the days. Jake, Jake Burton actually just passed away yeah. on Wednesday. Is that right? Or Thursday? Yeah, Wednesday. And we're recording this Saturday. So, I mean, obviously you've, you got a chance to meet him and. Oh yeah. We did, you know, he did the, the parties at his, his house every fall. That, oh, yeah, you know, right. I got to be a part of those and you know, the team, team shoots, he would come out to those every once in a while. And I mean, uh, that guy was the God. I mean, uh, he, you know, I, we, uh, we all, we all owe him. He's, uh, everybody does. Yeah. He's, um, he gave everyone an opportunity. He gave everyone such a huge chance. And, uh, it's, you know, Ed really sad to hear what, what went down, you know, it's, uh, yeah. it, it, there's no, you know, you'd never know, you never know. And, uh, really feel bad for the whole Burton family. And, uh, you know, I hope everyone pulls together. That's for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I, I feel definitely saddened for sure. We, lo- we lost a real good one. I'm encouraged and, and excited that in this day and age, what it means is we're about to hear a bunch of cool stories from oh, a yeah. bunch of cool people about things that Jake did. You know what I mean? I can only imagine the, I mean, I heard a lot of stories about everyone going to Stowe, I think was yesterday and oh, cool. all the signs that people are putting up at, at the resorts, but there was a big ride, ride at Stowe yesterday. And Rad. Uh, I can only imagine when, when, you know, Donna puts together a, or, you know, when they put together a memorial service I don't know where they're going to be able to host hold that many fr- people. Yeah. Right. Oh, I, I, I mean, never even thought of you're that. You're going to swarm, you know, since 19, I don't know what it was, 1980s or whatever. All 70, the, 70, he started the company. Yeah, there you go. All yeah. the people that were affected by Burton coming coming out, that's going to be crazy. Yeah, unbelievable. Yeah. Yeah, sad day, but at the same time, it's like, no, just sad day. I'll yeah. leave it at that. Yeah, it, yeah. It, no. he's, riding, he's riding power every day now with craig right like that's i've heard that a lot people imagine saying, the debauchery going on <laughs> <laughs> i can't even yeah true snowboarders that was the nice thing about jake was that anything you heard about him he was still snowboarding he was that was his thing was oh, like yeah. he's not like a ceo fat cat that was just sitting there taking, counting money t- taking time off going around the world with his family um i remember when just before the um before nagano happened he uh he said uh, we were all out in at Burton at that time, and they he came in from a meeting and said, um, uh, "Nike just called and they were going to buy him out." Oh. And he didn't even give it like a second thought. He was just like, "No," he just, but he came in just to tell everyone, that, you know, like he, I mean, he got offers all the time. I'm sure he right, but he he did not give a care about any of that stuff i mean he was all about wow all think of, about how that would have changed everything oh, i think the number two is like you know a half a billion dollars or whatever it was Oof. it was crazy i mean crazy at that time this was back yeah. in 90 this would have been in 97 98 right so yeah um but i he i remember i remember distinctly him saying that and he just he just is like not nah, not not doing it just kind of walked and closed the door and was just like get on you you know like he he doesn't need it you know, and, and you've got your name. So this is your name and this is you. This is your, you know, um, it's it's cool that someone doesn't get sick of what they love. You know, they can do it every single day and put a smile on your face and, and it makes you happy. I mean, that's, you know, that's what everyone wants. You know, that's, you yeah, know, you, you live to try and find that kind of thing. And he got it. He nailed it. Yeah. Yeah. That's fucking awesome. There is. Yeah, it that's counter to everything where you're looking at Burton going, they've got too much money. You know what I mean? We well, yeah, everyone it was wasn't like, about the everyone money. Everyone was like, Oh, you know, Burton sold out. I mean, you look at I mean, I, I was you know, I was associated with Oakley for ten years after I was the team manager for Oakley and so I, oh, I, did, I like I, worldwide? Uh, for Canada. For Canada. Canadian so like, team manager. Yeah, sure, so I mean, sure, like sure. I you know still I put, good put, guys on the team. Put Mark on the team. Yeah. Seth, yeah. I mean all those kids Fuck were yeah. that was Sick. My, my kids when I when I took over and they were um, that. So what I learned about is, you know, you get there's two mentalities in the snowboard industry. Obviously, there's the core, the skate sky guys that are like, you know, fuck the sellouts and you know, screw all the big corporation. Well, you know, 
yeah, Burton's lumped into that, but they are core. You know, yeah, yeah sure, they're big, but it's because they're popular, but they're still, it's still the same original people. That is core. That's sure they're making lots of products for lots of different things, but that's it the is definition still of core. Yeah. the family here. It's not yeah. like Nike came in and bought them out, and now it's got a, a Burton name on it, but it's owned by a conglomerate. This is still, you know, Burton. It's and crazy. That, and that's the big thing about it. You know, everyone was always about smaller brands and smaller brands. Well, it's not, you know, smaller. What? I mean, you, you got a company that has done so well that is developing all of the technology and making things so amazing. You need that. And, and you you got to support them as well. I mean, you, they, you owe them a lot for where the sport is to now. Uh, even a competitor competitor brand is learned from them. So you know, they're still a core brand. I mean, that's, in my eyes, that's still a core brand. And then, and, and, you know, despite how other people viewed that, you know, as being too big and sold out or, you know, corporate. I don't think people understand. I think it's just like a binary system where you just go like, I'm core. I yeah. ride, well, not stuff that I make at home. Sometimes, actually, I'm going to do that this year. I just ordered yeah. the Kind Pants. And I'm going to make them as big as those Kevin Young pants from <laughs> Kevin. The West Beach one. Yeah, because I just saw like an old shot of him, like an old, like, and I, and I was laughing, like how funny that looked. But there's a part of my brain that remembers when that was as cool as you could look. Yeah, yeah. And I'm just going to try and do that because <laughs> there is nobody. There's one guy at Mount Seymour that still wears shit that big. I'm going to be the second. I'm going to be that guy Hilarious. this year. I'm going to try. Yeah. Cause why not? Like, do the thing that's cool. Do the thing that you think is cool. Yeah. I'm gonna, and I realize I can't get pants that big, so I got extra larges. I'm gonna cut them, and I'm gonna sew a stripe on both <laughs> legs to make them as wide as so they cover the boots. It's they come Go together. Way over. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you saw that style. Take the high backs off, or? Oh no, this is just the pants. Okay. I'm gonna ride regular stuff Perfect. with this crazy getup on. And I'll try and find like a triple extra large jacket. You know, Maybe have, a fireman's if, one. If you talk to Jeff Patterson, he's probably got some of that old uh, vintage stuff. You may, you may not even have to sew it. You could probably it, just borrow something. Ooh, yeah, maybe. I don't know. I think there's something better to like cutting and sewing something expensive and nice and new, <laughs> right? Because that's what it was. Like when, when you would see somebody who did that, mm -hmm. and you'd be like, oh, my God. He took like those Burton pants and he cut them? We had a guy, um, Tom Kuchai, who's uh, still you know big in the in the industry in Alberta too. Uh, he was a pro rider, but he had his uh, he, was not, he had his own clothing brand called Cooch, Cooch. and that was it. He just made um, he made everything and anything. He was sewing stuff like for everyone, and it was awesome, man. He yeah, had, like, this cool brand that uh, that everyone was uh, you know it, it was you know the, at that time was all big baggy everything. And, yeah, um, he would just be make one you know take him a couple days, and next <laughs> weekend be wearing all new stuff again like. Yeah, it was awesome. What? Gooch. Unbelievable. It's yeah. too bad they never hooked up with Brian Aguchi. Gooch on Cooch. <laughs> <laughs> Brian Aguchi. <laughs> I can there see you the go. ads. Could, could yeah. be part of your uh, your uh, riders and pow. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Bring sure. Cooch and Gooch together. <laughs> Thank you for doing this, yeah, man. Yeah, thanks, Eric. So much fun. Yeah, and I'm looking forward to uh, listening to all the rest of the podcast, too. Great. Show. Great to meet you, man. Definitely. And I can't wait for this thing. Holy crap. Yeah, yeah let's do it. Awesome. Evan Rad shoutouts this week again to Al King, who's a dedicated listener who should have been a snowboarding agent. Also, big thanks to Corey A., another listener from Tahoe, who's agreed to help facilitate meeting up with the best Tahoe shreds. Couldn't have made this trip work without them. I want to take the time to thank Johan, Blue, and Tony from the Capita Supercorp. There's a great amount of history with Capita, Union, and Cole that I look forward to sharing with you guys, the listeners of this show. Be sure to come back next week for another episode of the Effenrad Snowboard Podcast, presented by Vans and brought to you by SIA Productions.